broadcast of the regular meeting of the Civil Rights Commission will now begin. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mackenzie Colas. I'm the chair of the Civil Rights Commission, and I'm going to call this meeting for April 19th to order. I want to welcome everyone joining us this evening. As we begin, I will note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by members of the commission and city staff as authorized under Minnesota statutes section 13D.021 due to the declared local public health emergency. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota Open Meeting Law. At this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Commissioner Burquist. Here. Commissioner Cobia. Here. Commissioner Davis. Commissioner Davis. Commissioner Devinish. Present. Commissioner Farrar. Present. Commissioner Fee. Here. Commissioner Fine. Here. Commissioner Folk. Present. Commissioner Gold. Present. Commissioner Hartz. Here. Commissioner Herkman. Here. Commissioner Lord. Here. Commissioner Rounds. Here. Commissioner Shepard. Here. Commissioner Sinani. Present. Commissioner Swift. Here. Commissioner Whitseth. Here, and for the good of the order, I'm dialing in from 2714 when we get to the public comment period. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Crowder. Here. Commissioner Stevens. Here. Vice Chair Shoemake. Here. Chair Colas. Here. There are 20 members present. I believe. Chair, our Commissioner Davis joined as well. Commissioner yes, Davis. I'm here. Perfect, yes. thank you. There are mm -hmm. 21 members present. Um, let the record reflect that we have quorum. Um, commissioners, the agenda for today's meeting is um, before us. Um, everyone should have received an email for that and that was posted on the public site as well. Um, may I please have a motion to adopt the agenda? Um, we have it on our screen as well. Thank you, Ted. Um, Motion please... to by uh, Secretary Stevens. Thank you. Seconded Thank by Stevens. We have a proper motion before us. Is there any discussion before the clerk calls the roll? Uh, Madam Chair, did you have an amendment that you wanted to bring forward at this time? I do not. Oh, all right. Thank you. Chair May, was that for the, the statement or did you no longer want to bring that up? I, I thought I was going to do that during my um, update. And did so you, I think, Jackie, is it correct to say that she could do it either way during her update or add it to the agenda? If it's going to be board business, you should add it to the agenda as an amendment at the beginning. Um, the operating rules provide that um, the agenda should not be uh, changed once it's been approved. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend that you add it at this time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I have an email from the UN regarding signing off on a letter. Um, so a, a statement that they have regarding some of the other work that we've done with the UN regarding systemic racism and police violence. So I just wanted to see if this is something that the commission would like to sign off on before we do that. So can I um, have a motion to uh, amend the agenda? To add that? Commissioner Stinani, someone moves. Second. Second by um, Commissioner Devnish. Thank you. Uh, we have a proper motion. Um, can the 
clerk call the roll to the dot. Or is there any other discussion? Uh, this is Commissioner Stignani, uh, Chair May. Uh, do we want to discuss the City Council resolution as part of the agenda, or is that just more of an update? I was going to give an update, but okay. I guess I'm I'm a, I'm learning the the rules of what needs to be on the agenda. So there is also a resolution that was passed at the City Council regarding lethal. Um, force in the, for the Minneapolis Police Department and um, some work has been done around that. I was going to do an update regarding that and kind of where we're at. Um, but let me know if I should do an amendment for that as well. Madam Chair, I believe you can um, you can add that under your report Perfect. since it's an update um, anticipating that there won't be any action coming forward. Okay. Anything else? Um, may the, uh, with that seeing none, uh, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll to on the motion. Commissioner Burquist. Yes. Commissioner Kovia. Yes. Commissioner Davis. Yes. Commissioner Devinish. Yes. Commissioner Farrar. Yes. Commissioner Fee. Yes. Commissioner Fine. Yes. Commissioner Folk. Yes. Commissioner Gold. Yes. Commissioner Hartz. Yes. Commissioner Herkman. Yes. Commissioner Lord. Yes. Commissioner Rance. Yes. Commissioner Shepard. Yes. Commissioner Sinani. Yes. Commissioner Swift. Yes. Commissioner Whitseth. Yes. Commissioner Crowder. Yes. Commissioner Stevens. Yes. Vice Chair Shoemake. Yes. Chair Colas. Yes. There are 21 ayes. Um, that motion, that uh, motion passes um, to amend the agenda. Um, is the agenda adopted now, or do we have to do another roll call for that? Uh, Madam Chair, I was assuming yes, I am, that it was uh, adopted as amended with that amendment. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you for the clarification. Um, next is the acceptance of the minutes from the March 15th meeting. Uh, may I please have a motion to accept the minutes? Prior to accepting the minutes, I'd like to make an adjustment to the minutes, please. Please. So if I'm to propose that adjustment now prior to acceptance of the minutes, item number five, with regard to the appeal that I made at the last meeting with the unexcused absences, the meeting minutes reflect that due to technical difficulties, the record of the roll call vote wasn't available and only one vote or one motion is actually recorded here. But there were actually two motions. There was one motion which was put that I actually provided good cause for being absent, and that motion passed. And then there was a second motion that I provided timely notice to the officers of the commission, and that motion was also passed. And I would like the minutes to reflect that both of those motions and votes occurred and were passed in the affirmative. Is there a second? This is Commissioner Burquist. I'll second the motion to amend the minutes. Well, we have a proper motion before us. Is there any discussion before the clerk calls the roll? Um, seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion. Commissioner Burquist. Yes. Commissioner Cobia. Yes. Commissioner Davis. Yes. Commissioner Devinish. Yes. Commissioner Farrar. Yes. Commissioner Fee. Yes. Commissioner Fine. Yes. Commissioner Folk. Yes. Commissioner Gold. Yes. Commissioner Hartz. Abstain. 
Commissioner Herkman. Yes. Commissioner Lord. Yes. Commissioner Rance. Yes. Commissioner Shepard. Yes. Commissioner Sinani. Yes. Commissioner Swift. Yes. Commissioner Whitseth. Yes. Commissioner Crowder. Commissioner Crowder. Sorry, yes. Commissioner Stevens. Yes. Vice Chair Shoemake. Yes. Chair Quillos. Yes. There are 21 ayes, 20 ayes, excuse me, and one abstention. Um, that motion passes and the minutes are accepted as presented. Um, item four on our agenda is an update from the African American Preservation Act, which will be given by Keyless Houston from the Complaint Investigations Division. I will now invite Ms. Houston to give that report. Hi, y'all. Khalees Houston, um, Executive Director of Village Arms. Um, I am here to um, present on the African American Family Preservation Act, um, a bill that I wrote in 2017 to address the disparities that exist within child protection for families of African descent. And I was invited by Commissioner Devinish, and um, I am not sure who's loading the PowerPoint, um, but I don't have share control. So I'll wait for that. All right. Um, the next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so I started the um, organization, a Christ centered organization, uh, Village Arms, to really. Um, aid and support African American families that are impacted by child protection. Um, after several years of advocacy, I decided to write the bill, the African American Family Preservation Act. This act would declare that it is the policy of this state to protect the best interests of African American children. And this act would promote the stability and security of African American families by establishing standards to prevent the unnecessary removal of black children from their families. And if you want to get additional information on the bill, it's Senate file 843, House file 1151. Uh, chief author in the uh, House is Representative Abaje, and in the Senate, um, Bobby Joe Champion. Next slide, please. Why does Minnesota need an African American Family Preservation Act? Next slide. I like to start with simple definitions so as not to assume that everyone knows, uh, but racial disproportionality is when the population of children of color in any system is higher than the population of children of color in the general population, and racial disparities um, is in relation to the lack of similarity or equality. Um, and unfortunately, both of these exist for uh, families of African descent involved with child protection. Next slide, please. Our children are overrepresented in child welfare in every state in the country. Uh, I got started in this work about seven years ago, um, the advocacy work, and that was after serving for five years um, at Hennepin County Central Intake Shelter. So this was the first stop for children just removed from their parents, just separated from their parents. Um, and it was there that I saw that at any given time, 100% of the kids on the unit would be African American. When they were there, they were with us for much longer periods of time than their Caucasian peers. And a lot of them came back to us three and four times a year before just aging out of the system without permanency. So uh, that means they were never reunified with their parents and they were never adopted. Um, I watched the trauma that children experience when separated. And I really had the opportunity to get to know the parents um, and learn that these were majority non-abusive parents that were just really dealing with issues uh, more so related to poverty um, and environment than anything. Research indicates that 23% of the children in foster care in 2018 were African American, although they made up less than 14% of the total US population. And this is pretty consistent annually. Next slide, please. 
And I'm going to rush through these because I only have about 20 minutes to do this and I usually take an hour, um, but I'll provide the uh, PowerPoint to Commissioner Devinish for those that um, wish to view it. In Minnesota, racial disparities and disproportionality again exist at every decision point of the child protection process for families of African descent. Next slide, please. In rates of reports to CPS, we are three times more likely to be reported than our Caucasian peers. Once that report comes in, we are three to four times more likely to be screened in. Um, anytime you're viewing, here I have um, African American and the children of two or more races category highlighted. Anytime you're reviewing uh, county or state data in relation to African American families, always pay attention to both categories because over 50% of the children in the two or more races category have a black parent. So that differentiation really skews the numbers in relation to how many of our families are involved with this system and how many of our children are actually in care. So always monitor both categories. In rates of removal, our children are three to 5.8 times more likely to be removed from their parents than uh, their Caucasian peers. And once the children are in out of home placement, uh, the more they experience multiple moves in placement settings. So in shelter, I watch children, um, they're with us for the max amount of time, which is about 90 days in shelter uh, before being placed in a culturally inappropriate foster home that typically disrupts. Then they're back with us. Some end up in residential treatment um, and then others juvenile detention. And that cycle just kind of continues until the age of 18, unfortunately. Next slide. Several components influence disparities within child welfare, beginning with racial bias and identification and reporting. And uh, our mandated reporters consistently make up the majority of reports to local agencies at about 80% annually. And Minnesota school personnel are among the highest reporters uh, and current data shows that they disproportionately report African-American students and families to child protection. Um, they, um, in 20, it was 2017, um, I um, visited the or was called into the county attorney's office that runs the be at school program and they were concerned about the reports that were coming in for school. What they found was that every school that year in the Minneapolis school district was over reporting black children and child protection. One of the schools, um, the data was so um, alarming that I, I always um, mention and I keep it in my trainings to talk about it. This school in particular had only a 16% African American student population. They made 145 calls to child protection. 130 of those calls were on their African American students. And this is consistent across service systems, including medical personnel and law enforcement. Next slide, please. Once a CPS report is received, CPS workers determine whether a family requires investigation or assessment. And when assigning reports to a family investigation path, there are both mandatory and discretionary reasons. So mandatory reason would be an allegation of physical abuse, sexual abuse, or egregious harm. And discretionary reasons could include uh, at the discretion of the child protection screener. And unfortunately, allegations concerning black children are more likely to be assigned for investigation for discretionary reasons than those concerning white children. And this is especially important because that uh, investigation track that families are placed on is more punitive uh, and it's more intrusive. It could involve the court and a maltreatment finding. And we're already working with families that are either at or below the poverty line. So a maltreatment finding could be extremely harmful for them uh, if they're working in the help in the helping field um, or a people serving field, teacher, a nurse, CNA, et cetera. A maltreatment finding could lead to a loss of employment and subsequently housing. Um, so this intervention really creates a, a cycle of future child protection uh, involvement and really harms that family's um, long-term well-being. Next slide, please. Once maltreatment has been substantiated, white families are more likely to receive services that allow the children to remain in the home, while families of color are more likely to have their children placed in out-of-home care. After serving for several years in shelter um, and watching the uh, bias and the disparities at that level, I wanted to have a voice in the courtroom. So I started to volunteer as a guardian at Lytham in Hennepin County, 
before taking a full-time position as a cultural specialist guardian at Lytham for Dakota County. And it was there that I saw that the counties and the courts to pe perpetuate the disparities that I was seeing in shelter. And that is what led me to um, the Capitol to uh, focus on policy and legislative reform. Um, and of course there were steps in between that, but for the sake of time, I won't get into all that. Um, there were two cases in particular as I served as a guardian at Lytham um, that I always, they still bother me to this day. One um, was an African-American mother um, early 20s, maybe 21, 22 years old. She had just had twin babies. She was living with an aunt of hers in North Minneapolis. Um, she had taken the kids out for their doctor's appointments on public transportation. When she returned home, it was a summer day, it was hot. She had to sit outside and wait for her aunt to come unlock the door, wait for her to return. The babies um, became overheated. Mom got frantic. The aunt finally got home. They rushed the babies in, put cold compresses on them to bring their body temperatures back down, uh, but someone had already alerted the police. The children were immediately removed from her care, and it took two years for her to be reunified. Her mother moved here from out of state after traveling back and forth to make the uh, court hearings every other month. Um, and the court still refused to place the um, the children in the care of the grandmother. It took some advocacy on my part to even get the, the uh, children with um, an aunt. Uh, but this was after um, a few failed foster care placements. On the flip side of that, Caucasian mother, same age, early 20s, using an illegal substance in her car, um, got into an accident um, on the highway, hit a guardrail, couldn't get her car out. The police were called. Uh, it was noted in the police report that there was paraphernalia found and mother seemed to be under the influence. Her child was never removed from her care. It wasn't until the fourth DUI with the child in the car that she was finally removed. Um, that child was immediately placed with a maternal grandmother and ultimately uh, reunified with her mother uh, much sooner than that uh, African-American mother. And this was not unique. Um, I saw it time and time again, and um, is one of the reasons that I continue to push for policy and practice reform. Next slide, please. We talk a lot about the school to prison pipeline, but for black children, there is also a foster care to prison pipeline. Our children are the highest population moving from child protection to juvenile detention, unfortunately. Next slide. I'm gonna pick on Hennepin County a bit here, although uh, disparities exist in uh, nearly every county um, in this state, um, but of course much more so in our largest and most diverse counties. We only make up about 13% of the population in Hennepin County, but about 70% of all screened in reports um, and nearly 50% or just over 50% of the out of placements or child removals and 50% uh, of the um, termination of parental rights, meaning 50% um, of the children that aren't able to be loved by, cared for, um, or known, taken care of by their parents are African-American children, unfortunately. Next slide. I always like to include this fun fact because everyone has an opinion as to why African-Americans um, are overrepresented in child protection, um, most of which um, are insulting. Most of those reasons are insulting. So I always like to include this information. According to Casey Family Programs and National Research Studies, Black families are no more likely to maltreat their children than white families. After controlling for such factors as income, unemployment, and location, we actually have lower rates of child maltreatment than Caucasian communities. Next slide. For folks outside of child welfare, you may not know who this child is. His name is Eric Dean. Um, in 2014, um, he was murdered by his stepmother after Polk County received 15 calls that he was a child in need of protection. These were some of the pictures that were submitted by people around him that loved and cared for him. Um, and because of the color of his skin, his parents were given the benefit of the doubt. Um, and she ultimately took his life. I was already at the Capitol 
um, in 2014 advocating around the issue of disproportionality and disparate treatment of black families um, when there was all of a sudden an inflow influx of folks um, from the governor to um, DHS commissioner directors uh, county officials and decision makers everyone demanding that um, child welfare be reformed as a result of this child's death I naively thought um, that there would be reform for black families as well because the issue of child welfare disproportionality is so long-standing and so well documented the result unfortunately um, of Eric Dean's death was a 73 percent increase in out-of-home placement of primarily black native and brown families brown children excuse me so um, his death unfortunately um, had nothing to do with our communities uh, but um, exacerbated an issue that we were already working to address um, and I like to use him as an example as well because the opposite is often true in cases involving black parents we can get one call to child protection and have our child removed based on lesser allegations next slide why is the rate of child welfare involvement higher for certain groups in comparison to others institutional racism and while this is a systemic issue that no one person is responsible for we all play a role in perpetuating it when we one deny its existence and two fail to acknowledge our own biases um, when we do that we really allow them to lead in our decision making and that's been evident um, as we review the data in child welfare with black and brown families coming in with uh, similar or less egregious allegations um, but with more negative and adverse outcomes. Next slide. This really resonated with me um, enough so that I wanted to quote it. According to the Minnesota Department of Health, disproportionate out of home placement rates are not the result of poor parenting by certain ethnic groups, but the outcome of multiple systems with long histories of discrimination and racist practices that enforce policies unfairly, unjustly, and unethically, while failing to provide enough supports to parents and guardians. And I've witnessed this um, in my work um, professionally and um, as a volunteer advocate uh, for families in this field. Next slide, please. The perpetual clogging of our child protection system with children that are not at risk of harm has exhausted the state's resources. Please note that the vast majority of families involved with child protection are not involved for physical or sexual abuse against their children, but so-called neglect. I call ne the neglect statute a, a catch-all statute uh, because it can mean anything, including inadequate food, clothing, or shelter. Uh, so what we find um, at times are when social workers are unable to name it abuse, uh, they'll name it neglect and then create a narrative that supports that position. This has lent to caseworker overload, a significant decrease in foster home availability and an increase in state spending while leaving children such as Eric Dean truly in need of protection, um, vulnerable and at risk. And I always tell folks this isn't a black issue. Uh, we're overworking the child protection system so much so that we can't protect the children that truly need it. And when we allow our bias um, or race to really lead in our decision making, again, we're harming um, more children, not just black children, but we're harming all children. Next slide, please. Everyone has a stake in ensuring this system is fair and equitable. Uh, we called on our legislators to support the following legislative action. Next slide. The Minnesota African American Family Preservation Act would serve to improve the mental health and social functioning of African American families in their community, protect children and strengthen families, reduce the overall cost of child welfare services and out of home placement. We spend upwards of 25,000 um, per year per child to place them in out of home care when in home services and support for these families would cost a fraction of that. Uh, it would also work to reduce law enforcement and judicial systems costs for intervention. Next slide. And I'm going to speed through these. I don't know how much time I have left, uh, but again, um, SF843HF1151, if folks want to read through that language. We spent a significant amount of time with DHS this year going through language, so there were some amendments that um, were made to the original language. 
Um, and as soon as we get that back from the revisor's office, we can share that as well. The bill will require that the agency make active efforts opposed to reasonable efforts to prevent out of home placement of African American child um, and to do this by using safety plans and by supporting familial and community supports like the natural supports that families have in place uh, to resolve whatever quote unquote crisis is occurring in the home. We really want to work to divert some of these families from child protection when it isn't an issue of actual abuse against their children. Prior to an African American child's placement in foster care, the agency must make active opposed to reasonable efforts to identify and locate the child's relatives and non custodial parents. Next slide. The Commissioner of Human Services shall modify existing practices related to visitation after an African American child is placed in foster care. Right now we have parents, once their child is removed, um, that see them one time a week for one or two hours. So we're asking that that time be increased. We're also, this bill would restrict the court's ability to terminate the parental rights of an African American parent based solely on that parent's failure to complete case plan requirements. Um, I call them cookie cutter case plans because no matter what the family comes into child protection for, the case plans are gonna look very similar. So we're asking that um, the courts not be able to use those plans um, as a means to, um, I'm sorry, as a means to um, terminate the parental rights of a parent. Next slide. This is one of those sections that was modified um, through um, our meetings with DHS. Uh, we were originally asking for a parent whose parental rights had been terminated to have 120 days to appeal that, um, but that was um, compromised and it is down to 60 days now. Um, it's still more than it currently is. I think parents get like 21 days to appeal the termination of parental rights um, and it's just not realistic. Um, for those termination of parental rights trials are um, extremely traumatic. Even as a professional, having done this uh, for quite some time now, um, it still, to me, uh, feels very akin to an auction block. Uh, we're sitting around and no one looks like the parent, no one looks like um, the advocate. Um, once the parent gets over the shock of that trial, because it's very similar to a criminal trial, they need time to process that, um, to find legal representation and to really understand what that appeal process looks like. So we wanted to extend that time for them. This next section speaks to the reestablishment of parental rights. Um, Bobby Joe Champion, Senator Bobby Joe Champion passed a bill a few years ago to reestablish parental rights um, of parents. But, and I thank him for his work on this because I know he had to really battle it out with the county attorney's office for the language that he did get. But there's a stipulation there that uh, states that the child has to be in foster care for four years before the parent can petition for reestablishment of parental rights. Um, that will work well for our teenagers that have been languishing in care for some time. But last I checked, the majority of the children that we're removing are zero to five years old. The cute little black babies that everyone wants to adopt, they don't sit in foster care for four years. Um, so by leaving that language, we leave a, a too large um, of a population of folks that just have no path to reunify with their children. And because we know that there's so much racial bias that exists at that point of contact in relation to who gets a termination of parental rights and who gets a transfer of legal custody, which is temporary, we absolutely have an, an obligation um, to create a path for reunification. So this bill's language would um, allow an, a parent to file a petition for reestablishment no matter the age of the child and no matter how long that child has been in foster care. Because I think even with the current language that um, Senator Bobby Cho got passed, <clears throat> the child has to be 10 years or older, I believe. So we want to remove that language to allow for more parents the opportunity to reunify. Next slide. And this section deals with um, employee misconduct uh, because we've seen so many 
um, instances where documentation has been fabricated or falsified, we added language in the bill um, that any local agency that fails to comply with this section will be subject to corrective action and a fine determined by the commissioner. If they are found to have made untrue statements about any case, withheld any information that may be material to a case, uh, fabricated or falsified any documentation or evidence relating to a case. Next slide, please. This section relates to um, cultural, um, culturally responsive training. I have to update that language because there is no such thing as culturally competent training, but we are asking for culturally responsive training to individuals working in child welfare. Next slide. We're asking for an African-American Child Welfare Oversight Council to help formulate policies and procedures relating to African-American Child Welfare Services to ensure that African-American families are provided with the services that they need and opportunities to care for their children in their homes. Next slide. We're asking for, and DHS as a result of my bill did create this department, an African-American Child Wellbeing Department. It's headed by uh, Devin Gilchrist currently. And um, this office will work um, with the African-American Child Welfare uh, Oversight Council. Next slide. We're asking for grants to African-American led organizations, service providers and programs that serve African-American children and their families um, to support uh, and fund those that exist but also to create RFPs to create more services for our families. There are about two agencies that serve African-American families specifically um, involved with child protection. It's mine, um, and then we have Minnesota One Stop for Communities. We have one ombudsman who's great, uh, Miss Ann Hill, uh, but she's charged with taking all African-American cases um, covering all 87 counties is just not realistic. So you can imagine the number of families that don't get the support and help that they need. Next slide. And I believe this is it. We're asking for the data to be disaggregated. This bill um, covers all families of African descent, although it reads African American. That's because when reviewing county and state data, you have the category African American, but it's all of us across the diaspora. So East African, West African, um, we're all lumped into the African American category. And we're asking for that, dis that data to be disaggregated because our cultures are very unique uh, as our uh, needs are. Um, so we're really asking um, that that be separated so we know who's involved and in, um, so that we can really uh, tailor those, in those interventions for the families. Uh, next slide. Oh, and that is the last one. My email address is here as well as our website. Um, if anyone has any questions or wants more information. And again, I'll share the uh, PowerPoint with uh, Commissioner Devnish for those that are interested. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. so much, so much for everything we're doing, we're doing with African American 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 Thank you. Hennepin County, but Minnesota in general. And um, I just want to open it up for any commissioners that might have any questions. And I have one myself. Thank you. Well, I just want to thank, uh, this is Commissioner Davis. I want to thank Ms. Houston for her time and her hard work on creating this bill. And uh, I guess my question is, as the Civil Rights Commission or the community, um, what can we do to help you uh, pass this bill? Because uh, from my understanding, it's not uh, a, a current bill. So what can we do to help? Yeah, so we did introduce it this year um, and we moved through the House. Um, we got um, yes votes in the House, um, but we didn't move in the Senate. And that was the case in 2019 as well. Of course, COVID kind of canceled the session for 2020, but in 2019, it was the same thing. We really need support um, from allies and um, the constituents of some of our uh, senators. Uh, Senator Limmer in particular, um, who covers, I believe, Maple Grove, um, to request that he um, allow this bill to be heard. Um, in committee so that we can get it moved. We're going to have um, an outreach campaign over the summer um, and welcome folks to get involved there. We're going to be doing uh, virtual phone banks and really targeting the Senate 
um, and then just getting out to get petitions signed as well to increase support of the bill, um, specifically targeting some of those uh, areas where um, child protection, uh, like North Minneapolis and some areas of St. Paul, where you see a high population of our children being removed, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, we'll have some brainstorming sessions over um, this summer. So if folks are interested, please, please um, reach out and um, you can join us that way. Miss Houston, this is Commissioner Rance. I sincerely want to thank you for um, this presentation and taking the initiative. Um, they're basically snatching our children. And Hennepin County has a history of that. Mm -hmm. And this has to stop. That's what they're doing. Um, I've worked with um, nonprofits, whether it be Phyllis Wheatley, I sit on the board of the Mastery School, and I've run into situations like this where Black families, um, American descendants of slaves, are being penalized for the, the disease of poverty and being poor. With that said, in the interim, specifically, how do you think that the city of Minneapolis, you know, and the weight of this Civil Rights Commission can be instrumental in helping this legislation move forward? And, and you may not have the, you know, a definitive answer for it, but I do think that it is something that um, has to be addressed mm -hmm. and so like i said if you don't have the answer for it, then i think that that's something that we need to to um to to, to take on well i have a question to add to that uh, uh commissioner rance uh i think miss houston mentioned writing uh certain senators and i was wondering as a commission can we come up write something uh maybe on one of the subcommittees or on a uh, yeah, I'm one of the subcommittees and, and send it to those particular senators. Is that something that we can do? Uh, and that's just uh, to maybe a ION or one of the uh, city um, members to answer that question. Are we allowed to write senators on, on behalf of this uh, subject asking to um, pass this uh, African American Preservation Act? And one thing I was going to add to that is that is exactly what the way that you can help, um, even by writing one letter of support. Um, we've gotten uh, Hennepin County to do it, uh, as well as Ramsey County. Um, but now uh, DHS, because they we worked with them on the language, we can get um, that um, letter of support from them as well. So it would be awesome um, if you could just write a letter of support, um, but then also, yes, reach out to those specific senators in addition, um, especially if you're in their district, because I yell at them all long asking for um, a, a hearing. But I mean, this issue doesn't resonate with them. These are black children. Um, they really need to hear from their constituents that this is an issue that their um, voters care about. Thank you. I was wondering, you know, with the we see that the disparities are so immense in in many parts of the child welfare system. I'm doing a lot of projects with um, my internship that I do on my own time uh, regarding child welfare and uh, the outcomes and the disparities that we see. And a lot of it comes down to even like individual bias. And so just thinking of how the reports are significantly um, seen in the schools, like what kind of training is available to people in the community when it comes to child welfare reporting or even the system in general? So one of the initiatives that we're doing in Ramsey County is mandated reporter training. And we did it for a short time in Hennepin County, but with their change and leadership, it was one of those initiatives that just kind of fell by the wayside. 
Uh, but what I would do is go out with the screeners when they train the uh, mandated reporters on their rights and responsibilities. I would train and talk to them about bias and reporting and how they lend to disproportionality. And that's actually a best practice. Um, mandated reporter training is a best practice in addressing racial disproportionality. And I found that they were all very receptive of the information. Um, a lot of them have been uh, trained to kind of CYA. Um, so they were just trying to cover their butts instead of really engaging the family and offering resources. If they suspected or even thought anything or were just unsure what they were seeing, they would pick up the phone and call child protection. So it was really uh, what they reported is that it was a relief to them to hear from child protection that they didn't have to be so kind of trigger happy in the sense of dialing them, but um, using them as a last resort. So um, again, it was great in Hennepin. I'm trying to get them to restart it, but we are doing that in Ramsey County um, in conjunction with some other um, initiatives to address bias at the screening level. Uh, and those things need to be coupled. But yeah, absolutely that training. And then folks that are mandated reporters, because you're armed with this information, you can start to talk to your peers about it as well um, and just get folks to kind of slow down and really assess the situation. You're only supposed to be calling child protection if you suspect the child is being abused. So don't just take that one incident, really consider what you know of that family um, and then ask questions. Uh, opposed to making assumptions because you're making a call that's going to have the government show up on someone's doorstep. It's a big deal. What, um, and that's Ms. Susan, how can this commission have um, an impact on the Minneapolis public school system? It's the largest school system in Hennepin County, and um, a lot of those teachers are not of color and are, are, a part of the problem. So how can we as a commission um, potentially address that maybe with Minneapolis public schools mm -hmm. to help in the interim while we're moving forward with getting this legislation passed? Addressing the school board, um, asking okay. for their data in relation to reporting and the county attorney's office uh, that runs the BS school program um, recovers that. Uh, so talking to them, too, about what they're seeing um, and then addressing the, the school board um, and, and really applying pressure for the school board to um, address this issue, because the reporting is the front door of child protection. So it, it, they absolutely should be held accountable uh, for over reporting black children. So um, I have a question to the commission. Is there anyone who's interested in is it okay if I volunteer to write a letter on behalf of the commission and maybe Ms. Houston, maybe you could help me put it together uh, to the senators and maybe possibly to the schools. Is that something that the commission is can do? I don't see why we shouldn't be able to do that and I would support that. So if that's a motion that I make a motion that <laughs> Commissioner Devinish um, start the initial draft of the letter Okay, I see Miss Neef on, so I think she has the answer. I think Commissioner Devonish, you, if you you seem to be asking if you think if that is within um, the commission's enumerated powers, and I do believe it is um, within your powers to advise the other agencies of government about issues affecting civil rights in Minneapolis, which this clearly appears to be. As far as the process for writing the letter, um, it would be great. For one person to draft it, but it should come back to the full commission for Absolutely. everyone to look at it and Absolutely. vote on it before it yes. goes anywhere. Absolutely. I'd be more than happy to follow those procedures. So uh, I believe Ken uh, put the uh, motion on the floor. Do we have a second? This is Commissioner Hartz. I second it. And Commissioner Devinish, um, I helped Chair Robbins write a proclamation last year and, and, um, I, I think I was hopefully useful to that. If you'd like um, a second set of eyes on it, I'd, I'd like to offer my help with, with it as well. And this is uh, Commissioner Bennett? Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Bennett Hartz. Okay, Hartz, okay. Um, I'll need to, I'll contact you via email and maybe we can uh, get together and put something together. Great. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioners. Is there any other comments regarding this uh, vote? 
Um, I, this is Commissioner Lord. I had a I had a question. Yes. Um, I, uh, to our presenter, um, there were so many good and powerful ideas that you reviewed that were so compelling. And I guess I, I was thinking about the um, benefit that they could afford all children in our community. You know, thinking, for example, about um, expanding from 21 days to 120 days after the trial period. You know, we have many folks in our Hmong community or our um, kind of Hispanic community who may not have English as a first language and might need extra time. You know, I guess I was just wondering about the applicability of some of these things to, you know, all members of our community. And I'm sure you've thought about that. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could maybe just um, respond to that. Yep, I have thought about it, uh, but because of the disparities, because the vast majority of termination of parental rights are black families, I have to focus on this population before I expand my reach to others. Um, I always compare it to children drowning. Um, there are several that are drowning and there are some that are on the shore. I have to get the ones that are drowning first and then I can focus on, on the others. Our Asian communities are actually underrepresented um, in child protection. Um, and disparities do not exist for um, our Caucasian peers at all, um, nor does overrepresentation. Um, so as soon as I, and we all know that when laws and policies work for black folks, they work for everybody. Um, just look at affirmative action. Um, so once we can get a handle on what's happening to black families, we'll have more leeway to address the entire system for all families, because it is a broken system. It just absolutely is, but it works better for some than it does others. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Is there any other comments or questions before we um, call roll on this vote? I'm sorry. This is Heidi Ritchie from the mayor's office, and I had to step out because I'm also toggling between the Ward 8 meeting um, and I just need a clarification on the motion. Yes. Yes, so um, this is Commissioner Rance. I made a motion that um, Commissioner Devonish and um, Commissioner BH, um, I apologize for, for that. That's all right, uh, Commissioner Hartz. Hartz, okay. Um, move forward on drafting a letter on behalf of the MCCR regarding the African-American um, Preservation Act. And that goes where? And that that would go to um, the um, state legislature and um, the Minneapolis public school system. And 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 it, it just um, the community at large. Would it be OK if maybe that came through our IGR and um, Mayor's office and council first. Wait, what was that? I'm just asking if it might be okay if the mayor's office, the council, and our IGR department would maybe be able to kind of take a look at the language before it was sent out. Yeah, we would. What we would do is we would draft something and then we'd bring it to the commission and then, you know, go from there. Okay, but I just want to say this, but here we go again with this commission potentially being stifled. And this is a civil rights issue, and I don't see why it should have to be scrutinized um, if we're advocating for the rights of our black citizens. And so I'm, I'm very leery of that, particularly in, in regards to what we went through with this accountability task force for the murder of George Floyd. Well, so I, I would mean, say, I would I say I would no to that. And say that. We like the, the mayor's office and the council. Well, I can only speak for the mayor's office. And that was kind of something that we didn't really have a good idea about. We weren't really notified about. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of good communication. And I guess that's why I'm here tonight, right? Is because I want to make sure there's better communication between the mayor's office and 
all of the groups for MCCR and both PCOC, which are doing a lot of similar work. So it, I don't know where it comes across that anyone's trying to stifle anything. I think we just want to be aware of what your concerns are. And if the best way of being aware of what your concerns are is by reading a letter that you plan to send to an outside organization, like, then I would love to read that letter. I just, what I worry about is, is not being on the same page when I know that there's a been, there's been a history of that, but we're also trying to correct that. So, you know, a way to correct that is writing a letter and asking for change. Is that this, just one way to do it? So it's just an idea of what can we do to create change? Absolutely. I'm wondering if, if, if you, if the mayor's office and the other people who reviewed this letter didn't agree with the language, what would, what would the result be? We would change it. I mean, I, wait, it, wh why? Well, that's kind of, I'm, I'm wondering why we would have to do that, even if we have supported this letter and it was agreed to by our commission. If the the reviewing groups did not support the language, that it feels to me like that wouldn't change much on our end. Is that correct? Is there an assumption that there's not going to be agreement, or I, I guess I I, I have. Experienced having to do this yet since I've been on the commission and I'm curious as to why we would need to now um, and I guess I just want to know what the worst case scenario might be then I think the commission should draft the letter and if the city wants to review it so be it but if the, the but if it's something that the commission another. comes up with, then we move forward with it. And if they can get down with it, great. And if they don't, then then they don't. Madam but, Chair, but I do think we have an opportunity. I mean, if I may ask yeah. a question, please. Um, there seems to be some context which some of us aren't aware of to do with whatever happened to the communications that were planned to come out of the Accountability for Killing George Floyd Task Force. And all I saw at that time was what was reported in the newspapers. And I heard some comment in passing here about what happened with the George Floyd task force. So I wonder if for all the commissioners that weren't involved, including myself, you can give us maybe some idea of what happened then. So we have some pre knowledge of what may happen if we pass communication up in the future. Thanks, Commissioner. Farr. I'm wondering if we can do that. Um, can we finish up with our speaker, Ms. Keyless, and then have that conversation during the task force update. I just I do want to be respectful of our speaker and the topic at hand. It's Khalid. certainly cool, but it does seem related to the motion about whether or not we do a letter now. OK. Uh, this is Commissioner Stignani, if I may be. Does it, this give a short comment. Um, for for Commissioner Farrar, uh, you know, <clears throat> The, the issue with the other statement sta started and ended with the city attorney, and the city attorney has weighed in on this one. Uh, so it's not similar to this present issue, but we can talk about, you know, the city attorney, uh, you know, actions for that when we get to the other part. But uh, I think that that uh, uh, attorney Naff has stepped in and, and uh, given us, you know, at least tacit permission to move forward with this. And... Uh, so I think we can, you know, move past the thing that happened there at this fairly, fairly adroitly. But uh, I do have a question for Director Ritchie. Uh, you used a three-letter acronym that I'm not familiar with. So for one of the new guys on the on the the board here, could you <laughs> let me know what that means? Which one? He's referring to the acronym. IPR, <laughs> ITR, or something along that line. What was that? IGR. IGR, what does that mean? IGR, sorry, intergovernmental relations. Fantastic, thank you. Director Ritchie, this is Commissioner Hartz. My, you know, I'm, if the, if the mayor's office or the city council or something says they have an issue with our letter, I have no problem just sending the letter as is. I, I don't think we need the approval of, of either office to send it. I'm wondering though, is, would there be an opportunity for the 
mayor's office and the city council to sign on to the letter. Because if they read the letter and they say, yeah, we agree, mm -hmm. then we can speak not just with the voice of the council, but with, you know, the, the whole of the basically elected um, body of Minneapolis. And I think that gives a lot more uh, uh, voice and credibility to to our position. So I'm, I'm interested if, in, in whether that's a possibility. Well, um, I'm going to defer to the city attorney's office before I answer that, because I feel like I always have to. Um, but I do have uh, an answer on that after Andrea Neff speaks. I will just jump in here and make a brief comment. Um, I think it's a little bit premature to assume that the mayor's office or the city council or the IGR folks would approve or disapprove of the letter. So we're going down a path we don't need to go down. Right now, the request that's been made is that the letter be shared with them. Um, you know, this body is created by ordinance and every each and every one of the commissioners is appointed by the mayor or the city council. And so it seems um, like an appropriate request that we share the letter, that the letter be shared with them. And I think going down a path of what if someone disapproves or approves um, is just very premature at this time. Thank you, Andrea. And I would just say that absolutely, like that's, that's the point in wanting to be able to see the letter because I think that we can, you know, ultimately come to a consensus. Okay, can we call roll? Yeah, absolutely. Or does anyone else have any more comments? Let's vote. Click, uh, can we ask you to call a roll on the motion? Just as a point of order, I'm seeing that some people have hands raised or had hand ra hands raised. Did they all get the chance to say what they we needed to say? Sounds like it. I don't see any hands up either. Commissioner Burquist. Yes. Commissioner Cobia. Yes. Commissioner Davis. Yes. Commissioner Devinish. Yes. Commissioner Farrar. Yes. Commissioner Fee. Yes. Commissioner Fine. Yes. Commissioner Folk. Yes. Commissioner Gold. Yes. Commissioner Hartz. Yes. Commissioner Herkman. Yes. Commissioner Lord. Yes. Commissioner Rance. Yes. Commissioner Shepard. Yes. Commissioner Sinani. Yes. Commissioner Swift. Yes. Commissioner Whitseth. Yes. Commissioner Crowder. Yes. Commissioner Stevens. Was that a yes, Commissioner Stevens? Yes. Thank you. Vice Chair Shoemake? Yes. Chair Colas? Yes. There are 21 ayes. Um, that motion has passed. Thank you. Thank oh, you, Commissioner Devinish. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate so you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and the next item on the agenda, we did the amendment. So, clerk, I, d I wasn't quite sure where I was going to be explaining the, the letter from the UN, but I can do that now. Yes, you can do it before the reports. That's easier for you. OK, and then I can just share my screen for the letter. Yes. Or you can send it to us and we can share it for you. Um, OK, yeah, because here's the statement actually. Can I just put it in the chat and then you open it that way or do you want me to email it to you? Either one works. 
And Chair May, I sent you an email and CC Ted, and that's the person that would normally. Um, so if you want to do it that way, but it doesn't matter. So um, this, let's see, I'll wait till it gets put up there for some context. We got a request um, this afternoon from the UN task force that we've been, we had our UN task force and we were working with um, the larger commissions um, regarding human rights and civil rights commission. And so they wanted us to sign off on a letter, two letters. Um, and so we're gonna have those joint statements pulled up. Um, this is very much related to some of the other work that we've done with the UN in previous meetings this year. Um, but I just, I wanna sign off on this and I guess, um, you know, this is something we should definitely be bringing back to the commission and um, voting on. Can everybody see the, the letter that was shared? So I just wanted everyone to have a chance to review it before we um, tell them that we would sign off or not um, sign on to this letter. It does have to be um, signed off on by the 29th. So just a, a point of clarification, what I'm what I'm okay. seeing up on the screen is the or an oral statement the U.S. delegation to the U.N. offices in Geneva delivered on March 19th. Mm -hmm. it, so this is like an official U.S. government statement. It doesn't seem like it's a request for signs on, but maybe we're looking at the wrong screen. I'm not quite sure. They sent me a few different links um, with um, a few different statements that they wanted signed. So um, there's a letter to uh, addressed to the High Commissioner um, and a letter addressed to the African um, group that they're working on uh, and they're working with families. Um, and then there's also a resolution and then they would like us to sign um, on by the 29th of April. So I did put that in the um, in the chat as well, and that does have two additional links, but I was just trying to do um, one at a time because there are two letters and a resolution. Um, but is that Ted? Ted, would you mind um, opening up the second document that I sent, or the second link in the chat? Thank you. And we, we previously did have a UN task force. Um, I wasn't very clear on how our commission wanted to handle the task force that did exist in 2020. Um, we have the policing task force, the COVID-19 task force, and the the UN task force. Um, so I don't know if there's members present that are wanting to continue to to work on these things, but that's something that we could also discuss. Um, yeah, and so these are the yeah, Ted. The letters are the first two links in this Google document. Is everyone able to see this or do do we need somebody to read this? Is this fine? Thank you. Andrea, give your hand up. I do. Chair Colas, I'm I'm just 
seeing this for the first time and I'm, I'm skimming this letter very quickly and I do see that it makes the statement about the ongoing George Floyd trial. And so because, um, because it does reference the George Floyd matter and we have an ongoing criminal trial related to that, I'm going to have to recommend that the commission not sign um, any documents that reference that trial at this time. The, the trial judge has um, admonished the city to just please stop talking about this matter. And so um, I don't believe that this would be the right thing to do. And this is Commissioner Stignani. Even though the trial has now mm -hmm. uh, gone to the jury and the jury is sequestered, there is no more opportunity for um, a mistrial, if you will. Um, that's still the city's posi city attorney's position? That is correct, Commissioner Stignani. Does anybody else have any um, discussion about Andrea's comment? Um, this is Commissioner Bergquist, when, when you get a chance. Please. Commissioner Berkvist. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt somebody else. So I noticed that for the sign on, the letters are embargoed until May 3rd. And so, you know, I, I'm not of a mind that we need to give deference to the advice of the city attorney on this point. If we as a body decide that we want to sign on, we can sign on. But if people are hesitant, what we could do is sign on but reach out to the u.s human rights network which is the organization coordinating the sign-ons and say that we would like to be able to withdraw our name before may 3rd when the embargo ends when the letter is lifted to have our name removed if if we have any concerns um and i would be you know i i think that would be fine to do and to defer to the chair or the executive committee to make that determination they could have you know, a meeting, uh, they could schedule a meeting on May 2nd to make that determination and to decide whether they need to reach out to the US Human Rights Network to have the name removed. But it it is, it is complicated because they want us to act pretty quickly and we won't have another scheduled meeting before the end of the embargo date as well. So that might be a way to facilitate the process. Yeah, absolutely. Well, then we can we can table this item unless anybody else um, has any other comments. I think Commissioner Burkus was suggesting we move to provisionally oh. approve this. Uh, is okay. that correct, Chairman Burkus or Chair Commissioner Burkus? I appreciate the promotion, but <laughs> no thanks. Um, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, I would be supportive of a motion to sign or endorse both letters but to authorize the executive committee or the chair to meet prior to the embargo release date to um, if, if they determine that that endorsement would be counterproductive to the ongoing proceedings against um, Officer Chauvin. Do we have a second? This is Commissioner Devinish. I second the motion. Um, yeah, do we have any other discussion before the clerk calls the roll? We have a proper well, motion. I wasn't I wasn't able to read the whole letter. Yeah, you're right. So we need to continue going through. Um, this is Commissioner Shepard. I have a question. Is it possible that we could vote on this, whether or not to sign, but wait to sign until after a verdict is reached. Do we? I, I just wanted to add, because I don't think it's a fair assertion that a mistrial is not possible at this point. A verdict is not reached, so a mistrial is absolutely possible. It could be a hung jury. Mm -hmm. There could be a number of reasons how, why a mistrial could still be reached at this point. The the deadline for signing on is April 29th, so we could make that the deadline for the executive committee to make a determination based on the status of the current proceedings. 
if we want to amend the motion. Commissioner Fine. Yeah, w one comment uh, that the assistant city attorney may have an opinion on. The current trial is one officer. There's three more officers that are still pending in a number of months, all related to George Floyd. So that is still, a, it may be a continuing problem. Yes, I'd be happy to weigh in on that. I, I believe Commissioner Fine is correct. This is an ongoing problem. Um, it will be ongoing as there will likely be appeals following this trial. Um, it is not correct to say you can't have a mistrial. We could have a hung jury. We could have another trial, um, you know, a retrial. Um, so uh, this this matter is not concluded. Um, Judge Cahill's um, concerns are are very valid and will remain so for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Okay. Could, if I can interject for just a moment, both letters specifically refer to the ongoing trial of the Minneapolis City police officer who killed George Floyd. So it, the, to the extent that there's a reference to a, a, an ongoing matter, it's only for the trial of Derek Chauvin. It doesn't refer to the other officers who have been charged. I think on this one, you know, I can see that others may not agree with the position of the city attorney's office, but it is the position of the city attorney's office that no comments should be made about the trial of George Floyd, in, uh, relating to George Floyd, including the other officers, um, you know, especially while we're in deliberations. Um, that that opinion isn't really open for discussion or reevaluation. It, it just is the opinion. I understand that everyone may not agree with it. But I really just wouldn't want to see this commission, um, a s statement of the commission cited in documents on appeal, trying to appeal a conviction. I wouldn't want to see them cited in a motion to, um, you know, for a mistrial or for a retrial in uh, an outstate county. Um, you know, another motion to move the trial, um, you know, to uh, Brainerd or Wilmer. Um, I don't think that any of those things would serve the interests of um, you know, bringing this to a conclusion um, well. And I don't think that they would be something the commission would want um, their statements to be used for. And so for those reasons, I just really urge you not to comment um, on this matter. We, um, oh, we have a hand up. We have a motion on the floor, but I mean, with what Miss Neve is saying, what I mean, do we want to withdraw the motion? This is Commissioner Gold, um, and I just had a question for um, the city attorney, Andrea Neff. So um, because I'm new on this commission, I guess I'm just wondering, we could our MCCR get in trouble for signing this document? Um, I'll try to address that as best I can, Commissioner Gold. Um, you know, when you say get in trouble, um, the the trial judge in um, the ongoing criminal trial has requested that the city stop talking about this case. He's expressed quite a bit of irritation with um, continued publicity um, relating to the case and has directly said, I want the city to stop talking about this. Um, I would not speculate about exactly what the judge might do with um, continued publicity, but I wouldn't want to find that out either because it can have adverse consequences in, in criminal trial matters, including motions for mistrial, motions, motions for continuances, um, and appeals and motions to change venue. And um, none of those things are um, something that I would want the commission statements to be referenced in. Um, I don't believe it's it's the kind of publicity that this commission would desire. 
and I don't believe it would um, be conducive to concluding um, to you know concluding this trial. Um, hopefully, sometime in the near future. So um, for those reasons, I can't tell you exactly what would happen. And I'm not saying you personally would get in trouble, um, but I, I just strongly do not recommend this. Commissioner, Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Gold, the fear is that the jury might be ready to return a guilty verdict against Derek Chauvin and the defense is able to get the case thrown out or, or declared a mistrial because because the judge sees our statement and says, you know what, that's just one step too far. I told the city to stop interfering and trying to sway the jury and trying to sway the opinion of the public. And this is the last straw, you know, that's that's the fear. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so if I'm understanding this correctly, we need to have this in by April 29th. And I'm a, I am I am totally assuming because I'm hopeful, like all of us here, that there will be a verdict, you know, in the very near future. Um, and so I guess I don't know. I didn't get to you know read all the specifics in this letter, but I do feel like it aligns with this body. And um, it's no disrespect to the city attorney or anyone else, but I feel comfortable signing it. So I, this is Commissioner uh, this Berquist, Commissioner I guess. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Berquist. Sorry, I just, since I think I'm the one who made the resolution, I'm comfortable going forward with a vote on the resolution. If people vote against it, that, that that's fine. I, I certainly understand the concerns. Um, I, I, I think to the extent that the judge in the current case has concerns, I think it's a bit of a stretch to suggest that the Civil Rights Commission, which is an independent body, it isn't elected officials of the city of Minneapolis, it's an independent body, that we are one of likely hundreds of organizations and individuals signing on to two letters that are addressed not to the general public, not to the jury, not addressed to the media, but addressed to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and the African group at the UN Human Rights Council. That just seems like it, it would be a stretch for the judge to hold that in contempt for the defense to argue that this is somehow swaying the jury. It's, I mean, I'm, sort of a UN nerd and this is really insidery stuff that you know it's not going to get coverage like I, I just it seems like you know a little paranoia is a good thing but a lot of paranoia can stifle the voice of, of what I think is an important public body in the international community. Chair Konos, I do see Commissioner Shumake has her hand raised. Oh, Vice Chair Shumake. Um. Yes, I was um, to answer Commissioner Gold's question. I was just giving the example of how Maxine Waters had made a statement last night or today, and the defense used it uh, as an argument to make a motion for a mistrial. So, like, it just it's nasty, I feel like, what people can do to kind of twist anything for an argument like that. But I definitely agree with Commissioner's, Commissioner Bergquist's statement that, the yeah, this UN process, the Universal Periodic Review, like all, all of this is a very intricate process that most in that regard um but if it would make fe people feel more comfortable maybe we could um see if there is a determination uh, an outcome of the jury by the 29th so. this is commissioner with us i'm of the mind and i would be ready to make a friendly motion for a friendly amendment or maybe we can vote to the pending motion, then if it fails, carry a new motion. But I'm of the mind that I would like to empower the executive committee to sign the letter at its discretion at a date uncertain, you know, up to April 28th. I'm not sure if that, that's even a procedural possibility, but um, that's kind of my preferred path forward here. Thank you, Commissioner. As Commissioner Request, I'd be open to that as a friendly amendment if, if such a thing exists under our rules of procedure.
clerk, is that not is that able to be done? <clears throat> Uh, Madam Chair, if there's no objection from the maker of the motion, um, of course, Commissioner Ber Berquist can add language to to uh, her main motion. OK, then I would like to add as a friendly amendment that the commission empowers the executive council to sign this letter at its discretion um, at any time before April 29th. Is there a second? I'll second. This is Commissioner Fogel. We have a proper motion. Um, anything else before the clerk calls um, the roll? This is Commissioner Lord. I, I still haven't read the whole thing. I'm so sorry. If you could put it up on the screen again. I don't feel like I can vote on it without reading it. If you also want to um, open up the links, they're in the chat, so you'll it's be able the to second talk. link in the chat yep. that will take you to. There are two different links. <laughs> they read the letter. Those are the letters that are being put on the screen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amy. Well, Commissioner Lord is looking that over. I wanted to ask is was that Commissioner Hertz that made that motion? Um, Negative. He... That is Commissioner Woodset. Woodset, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. That made the amendment on the on the motion. Right. That's right. I proposed a friendly amendment to Commissioner yeah. Berkwith's motion. Commissioner Lord, are you? Are yeah, you well? thank you. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Chair, could I just summarize the motion then would be that mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Berkquist moves to endorse both letters and to empower the executive committee to send the letters at its discretion anytime before April 29th. Thank you. Are we um, able to call the roll? Yes, I can call the roll. Commissioner Cobia. I'm sorry, Commissioner Burquist. Yes. Commissioner Cobia. Yes. Commissioner Davis. Yes. Commissioner Devinish. I will respectfully abstain. Commissioner Farrar. Yes. Commissioner Fee? Yes. Commissioner Fine? No. Commissioner Folk? Yes. Commissioner Gold? Yes. Commissioner Hertz? As a member of the Attorney General's Office on, on all things George Floyd and Derek Chauvin related, I will continue to abstain. Commissioner Herkman. Yes. Commissioner Lord. No. Commissioner Rance. Yes. Commissioner Shepard. No. Commissioner Stenani. Abstain. Commissioner Swift. Yes. Commissioner Woodseth. Yes. Commissioner Crowder. Abstain. Commissioner Stevens.
Como se estivemos. Commissioner Stevens, you might be muted. Commissioner Stevens noted at the beginning of the meeting that she might be abstaining. Oh, abstaining. Oh, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Vice Chair Shumake. Yes. Chair Colas. Yes. There are 13 ayes, three nays, and five abstentions. That motion passes. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, the executive committee will um, will review and, and make plans for that prior to the 29th. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, the next order of business is the acceptance of public comments. Um, I will open the floor and invite comments from the community um, and each speaker will be allowed to speak for two minutes. Um, and then our is is the clerk's office able to do the the timekeeping or is that something that I need to do? Just for clear. I can I can do the timekeeping. Thank you. Um, with that, are there any uh, community members on the line who wish to address the commission? There are no callers. Madam, Madam oh, thank you, Ted. Yeah. Yes, there are no callers. There are no callers presently on the on the call. Thank you. And Come I in. did put in the chat as well, um, Commissioner Stevens. Uh, we the open meeting law requires that you need to verbalize your vote. So if you could please call into the meeting, and then we will be able to um, record you on on uh, on votes, seeing that your microphone's malfunctioning. My understanding she was like we could hear her speak we just couldn't hear what she said so i think that's probably fine for purposes of counting her vote again which, uh, which was an abstention nonetheless so can you guys hear me anyone hear me thank you thank you yeah. commissioner stevens yes can you please verbalize your um your vote on the last roll so that we have it on the record abstain please thank you sorry about that Thank you, Commissioner Stevens. Item seven on our agenda um, are the report outs from the uh, committees that are newly established. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from everyone. Um, so we will start off with the um, accountability for the killing of George Floyd task force. Uh, hi, this is uh, Commissioner Lord and um, I have an update on where uh, our work on this task force has gone. I'm just getting my notes in front of me. Um, so in our last episode, just to remind you of kind of where we where we left it at the end of our last commission meeting, we had all um, or we had an approved motion to move forward with a statement that we had all collaborated on. Um, it included um, some educational resources as well, um, and uh, at a high level, um, encouraged peaceful demonstration, uh, condemned violence, um, and provided you know resources for our community. Um, we had agreed that next steps would be to socialize that statement in the community, as well as you know um, sharing that statement with. Uh, elected officials like council members. Um, subsequent, uh, after that commission meeting, um, we reached out to uh, an individual in the city's attorney's offices. Andrea was actually on vacation, so it went to, uh, I think it's her boss, Ms. Ms. Trammell, um, who provided an opinion uh, on this statement and for the purposes of, of catching everyone up on the commission, I will um, read her opinion uh, in full here. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty short. Um, uh, Commissioner Rance had reached out to her, so it's addressed to him. Um, 
Mr. Rance, thank you for taking the thoughtful approach and seeking advice on the MCCR's intended path of action rather than just acting. I have thoroughly reviewed your proposed letter. My advice to you is to not send this letter uh, to the press or otherwise publish it. The basis for my opinion is twofold. One, the MCCR and the George Floyd, Floyd Task Force lack authority to issue such statements. And two, Judge Cahill has requested the city refrain from creating further publicity in an effort to provide a fair trial. The MCCR was created for the purpose of carrying forward the policies of the city in the field of human relations to promote civil rights and enforce the provisions of, um, and she inserts an ordinance number here, um, and another, uh, the MCCR and any task forces or subcommittees, it may create pursuance, another ordinance number, have limited authority. The MCCR is limited to advising, quote, the mayor, the city council and departments or agencies of government with respect to matters relating to the commission's purpose, end quote, and other duties and powers listed in another ordinance as cited. The enumerated powers do not include issuing press statements related to criminal trials. So following that um, statement, which um, I think uh, was surprising, certainly to me at least, um, Commissioner Stignani uh, provided a very thoughtful um, rebuttal, um, primarily focusing on the city attorney's perspective that the MCR is, quote, limited to advising the mayor, city council, and departments or agencies of government with respect to matters relating to the commission's purpose. So it was not, uh, in our, I think in uh, Commissioner Stignani, in my, mine's opinion certainly, was not uh, giving credence to the ordinance clear um, uh, allowance of communicating directly to the, the public. Um, we then uh, had a task force meeting as well as an additional conversation with Andrea, uh, Director Reed, uh, and Kayla, um, where we discussed, really focused on the discussion around the risk of putting out a statement that was even contextually related to the trial. I mean, I think our position was this really wasn't about the trial at all, but about demonstrations. Um, and we agreed that we would come back to the commission and provide that um, perspective um, as the uh, city attorney, and, and I think Andrea said this several times tonight, believes there is some uh, risk to having a fair uh, trial, a fair uh, trial here in the city. Um, let me stop there and ask that other members on the task force um, Commissioner Stignani, Rance, Herkman, other whomever else would like to comment, add or uh, course correct me if I've misremembered anything that I've just shared. Commissioner Stignani would like to reserve his comment until others have commented. Commissioner Gold or Commissioner. Polk? Or, sorry, was that you, Paul? Go ahead. Yes, Commissioner Hurt, when I was just saying that seemed like an accurate uh, update. If this is Commissioner Folk. I have nothing to add. I agree. This is Commissioner Devnish. I agree with everything that you said, um, Commissioner Lloyd. And is that Commissioner uh, Farrar? Um, yes, I do have a question. In the discussions that you had, was some distinction drawn between these particular communications and sending them to the public and rather than the mayor or government agency? And for example, the commission communications that occurred last year, such as the forum we had with the public over disparities in educational outcomes, which in terms of communicating with the public appear to be exactly the same kind of communication uh, raised no issues with the city attorney previously. Mm -hmm. Did that come up at all in any of the discussions that you had or referencing the attorney's letters and opinions before? Yeah, thank, thank you for that question. Um, 
there there did seem to be um, acquiescence to the idea of us sharing the statement and uh, with our with elected officials. And in fact, Commissioner Stignani, Chair May, and myself had a uh, conversation with Councilperson Sh uh, Jeremy Schrader, or maybe it's Schroeder. I, I mess up on his the name pronunciation of his name. Um, and did speak with him about the statement. Um, to your second point, it does seem like a, um, it just seems like an inaccurate, frankly, reading of our uh, purview per the ordinance. And I think, you know, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I know I take, you know, issue with that interpretation. I think it's very clear that we have the right and the responsibility to be communicating with the public um, and, you know, just think Ms. Trammell is not correct in her assertions there. This is Commissioner Stignani. Um, you know, I think that we all on the call agreed uh, that, you know, we don't want anything untoward to happen to the trial. And, you know, the point they seem to draw, especially uh, Attorney Trammell, that this is really about commentary on a, uh, a criminal trial rather than anything else above and beyond. Because, I mean, uh, in May 20th of last year, the there was a joint statement issued by the City Council, no, excuse me, the City Council, the, the uh, Civil Rights Department and the MCCR on Facebook and Twitter uh, that has that statement had been scrubbed from the Minneapolis uh, .gov website, uh, but fortunately um, there was archives of it elsewhere on the internet and I recovered that. Um, um, Ted, uh, could you push that, put that up on screen for us? It's the one with the un unintelligible title. So this was a joint statement that was released of May of last year. It was at least on the internet on the city website until November of last year. So if for those could scroll through that, um, this was what was preferably allowed uh, at the time of George Floyd's killing, and uh, you know very similar in format and nature to what we came up with, including you know, in that. In fact, there were some. So I think some good uh, research references at the end there. Um, for those who are on the council, do you any of you recall going through this previously, or was this something that was done independently of the of the commission just by the the, the executive committee? This is Commissioner Burquist. The executive committee members can correct me if I'm wrong, but I I think I recall when I saw this real thinking that it hadn't come before the commission that it was just the chair acting independently i'm not sure that the executive committee was involved either but i wasn't on the executive committee so i wouldn't know specifically but i think i remember thinking this was just the the head of the department and the chair of the commission who got together and wrote this letter or, or somebody wrote it for them and, and signed this letter without the commission's involvement but perhaps some other commissioners can add what they recall as well. Commissioner with that here, isn't it only signed by the chair? Or is it signed by the commission? It was jointly signed by the head of the Civil Rights Department at the time, as well as the uh, chair of the Civil Rights Commission. So, you know, it My was released in our similar to Commissioner Berkeley. Yeah. So as you can see here, this is largely similar, actually probably a bit more uh, volatile than what we had proposed. Um, so this was, um, this has been out there, was out there at least publicly available till November of, la of last year. So um, I submit this as evidence of that, you know, we are very much allowed to do, do something like this because this was done, um, you know, I guess in our name previously, but you know, regardless of that, I do I do concur with the city attorney that we don't want to impact a trial. I think that that's right. Um, so, my suggestions and thoughts as we're thinking about what to do about the civil rights or the commission on uh, task force 
okay, accountability for killing of George Floyd, is let's take any reference out uh, to the trial out of this and make this really about you know people's civil rights and uh, release it you know at the point of where let's take the point away from the city attorney. Let's make this about uh, giving people freedom to file complaints and know where they put their 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 uh, votes as well as their uh, complaints. And so rather than belabor what the city attorney has put forth or not put forth, I think that's a, that's a, that's definitely another subject for another meeting because I I will not let that that part go away. But I think as far as getting something that's useful out to the community, it has nothing mentioned in it that is relevant to George Floyd, the trial or anything else. We can even rename our task force. So my offer to the group is let's let's not make this about the trial. And I would so move to amend the task force name as well as the statement in such a manner that it takes all mention of the civil trial or criminal trial for that matter out of it and remove the make the point moot. Commissioner Signani. Yes. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate you for um, giving that update. I, um, Commissioner Signani and I had a chance to <clears throat> discuss potentially what it would look like to pivot on this task force so that we are able to um, do what our intention was, which is, you know, letting people know what their rights are, <clears throat> giving people those resources and, and tools, and then, you know, educating. And so if, you know, that's something, I'm not sure. Was that a motion, Commissioner? That was a motion. Can I second Walk. that motion? If you'd like. Uh, Madam Chair, and, um, Clerk Hanson, would Claire? you like me to restate my motion? Could you restate it and then do you have an alternate name for the task force? I, uh, I move to remove all references and intonations towards the George Floyd trial and rename the task force the task force for uh, informing the public about their civil rights and to then remove any reference to the trial in the body of the statement itself and to incorporate other references from the previous statement by the Civil Rights Department and the, the previous statement by the Minneapolis Commission on Civil Rights in adding those references into the statement for release to the public. I second As a point of order, Commissioner Stignani, doesn't the renaming that you've just suggested actually look like exactly the remit of the Community Engagement and Research Subcommittee? So that I think that what you're doing would effectively just subsume well, what you're suggesting back into that committee, which may be the outcome that you want, and that may be actually a, the, the outcome that we are looking for. You've read my mind, sir. Mm -hmm. This is, it, was that this is Commissioner Ranch. Is that a quick question? So if we do um, sanitize, for lack of a better euphemism, how soon can we get this out to the public? You know, what's our speed to market with this? Well, if we subsume it back into the committee, how soon can the committee find a time to meet and approve it? Or do we want to, to you know, give like we did with the UN statement, the ability to for the executive committee to, you know, give the blessing and move it, you know, move it forward with speed? Can we, yeah, what in my in my humble opinion, um, whatever is going to get this out there because the clock is ticking. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, things are um, happening as we speak. So whatever is going to, you know, expedite this, um, then I'm, I'm for it. 
This is Commissioner Gold. Can we throw up our statement um, so we can all see it just to refresh? And Ted, I gave that to you as well. So I'll, I'll I'll talk if the committee doesn't or commission doesn't mind. I mean, basically, we would write the first sentence and the second sentence, and we would replace the first and second sentences. They will, we believe it's everybody's right to protest peacefully. Um, something generic. And you know, I would also say the city council has made it clear that they don't really have any. Power and uh, City Attorney Crowder made this eminently clear on Friday at the City Council meeting that uh, essentially the mayor has full control over the police. So would recommend deleting the City Council from point two, and you know essentially add the other uh, links and references from the previous joint statement as other references to the baseline there. So that would be. Um, my you know, suggested changes. Everything else is pretty much as is. I'm wondering if there's any way we could make those changes kind of in real time right now and have the full commission approve this um, statement right now. Yes. Without having to send it back to a task force. Commissioner Stignani withdraws his prior amend, uh, motion for uh, and resubmits this as you know a real time edit. A motion to real time edit this. I think we would just need to address the top two sentences. Um, and the point two. Seemed, point two. Yes, you're right. And point two. Director Richie has her hand up. Thank you. Um, so in part two, we're um, proposing to put out to take out city council. Per the uh, Jim Crowder's commentary on Friday, he, he, so he mentioned that the police are the uh, absolute authority of the uh, the mayor. City Council doesn't have any control over um, the police other than budget. Well, yes, that's true, except for like in terms of being able to authorize overtime or um, add new recruit classes in order to make up for all of the hundreds of police officers we've lost. I don't think it's really fair to exhort the city council from that or take them out. I'm in a, this is uh, Commissioner Herkman. I'm in agreement. I think that they wield enough leadership in the areas and we've got tangential things where it's not just police. We talk about any support units as promised by the city and they're clearly responsible for some of what the city offers in both escalation and de-escalation. So um, I think it's appropriate to keep the city council there as a means of accountability. Ms. Neef, you have your hand up. Yes, I was just going to comment briefly. I do appreciate the, the move of this statement away from focusing on George Floyd and the trial um, and do definitely view this as a, an improvement. I still do have some hesitations about the timing of this and some concerns about the timing of this, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say so. Um, but I do appreciate um, that the, the references to the trial and George Floyd are being removed and, and um, Thank you for doing that. 
Um, the other comment I'd just make, and you know, maybe this is less of an issue um, since Ms. Ritchie from the mayor's office is here, is just that um, coordination across the city enterprise is a beneficial thing, especially given the sensitivity of this matter. Um, so I, I would also um, defer to, you know, Ms. Ritchie as to the level of coordination across the enterprise that she thinks is um, important at this particular time. Uh, attorney Neff, if I may ask, uh, can you confirm uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner, City Attorney uh, Crowder's statement of, uh, uh, on last Friday's uh, City Council meeting? Was that statement correct that he, you know, the, the mayor wields absolute power about, about the police force? Uh, City Attorney Router commented, I, I believe what you're talking about is a provision of the city charter that provides that the mayor has complete control over the Minneapolis Police Department's operations. <laughs> Obviously, the ex exact extent of that is a subject of much um, political push and pull, as alluded to by Ms. Ritchie, because mm -hmm. The mayor's control um, obviously has, um, you know, there, there are budgetary implications and the um, city council controls the budget and the number of officers and uh, to a certain extent, the number of officers and other things that do impact um, the police department. So it is not exactly a one size, size fits all um, perfect answer. Um, the, the charter does provide, as Mr. Rudder said, for complete control of the operations, but it's not fair to say that the city council has no impact, because um, certainly they do. Thank you. I would also note that this is the subject of um, current efforts to amend the city charter, multiple efforts um, that are, are going to, or may be on the ballot um, this fall. So, you know, the uh, exact state of the control of the police department is something that we may see um, evolve in the future. Was this something that we're able to um, edit in real time? So, um, I could I could throw out this is Commissioner Lord. I could throw out a suggestion for critique for a replacement first line. Um, here I could put it in the chat. Actually, I guess. Actually, um, if Ted Ted, are you able to uh, edit that uh, in a PDF? No, at this time I'm not. Um, the okay. last time I think the clerk was doing some real time editing. I think Casey was in the meeting last time doing some editing. Um, Madam Chair, I'd have to go find the statement, um, which I could do. It'll take me a couple minutes, but or I can put it in if uh, Commissioner Lord puts it in the chat. I can also. Um, you know, we can verbalize it as well. Yeah. Well, and mm -hmm. if we agree on the if we agree on the language, we can always like follow up with a modified statement, right? Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if we could say something and replace the first two sentences with just a general statement, something like, and we would want to spell out our name and not use an acronym in the first usage, but mm -hmm. Uh, the MCCR supports and defends the rights of our community members to exercise their civil rights. Um, and then we could get right into our points if there's kind of nothing else to say after that. Do we need a transition maybe a little bit more of a transition? Heidi, are you adding that as a an edit? Well, I mean, I have to see it first, but I just I really feel like I need to impress upon everybody that the mayor and the police chief feel the exact same way. So I don't. I believe her or she's frozen. <clears throat> well, 
Well, I mean, you know, well, we can wait till she gets back on. But I mean, if if the mayor and the police chief want to join us in this releasing this right mm -hmm. statement, you know, I, I'm all for them, you know, adding their names and signatures to this. Does anybody else feel that's appropriate? OK, I think I'm back. Sorry, okay. my computer set down. No worries, and I'll, I'll catch you up here. This is Commissioner Signani. I mean, yeah, if if you're proposing that the mayor and police chief would want to add themselves to and sign on to this statement, endorsing people's right to peacefully protest, I mean, we're I'm, uh, you know, I have no objections to that. Uh, if you'd like to, is that what you're proposing to us? Well, I guess that's what I'm saying is sending me what you guys put together because I think we're we're also trying to put something together that's along the same vein. Well, yeah, you know, we're trying to get this out this week here. So um, what we'd like to oh, do trust is- trust me, <laughs> we are if you, too. <laughs> if you'd like to join us though, I mean, I, you know, again, I don't mean to speak for the rest of the commission, but um, if you, if the mayor and police chief would like to sign their names at the bottom of all these references of how to, you know, full, do civil rights and, and uh, you know, peacefully, com you know, add complaints if there's a, a violation of rights. Happy to, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to in, in, in encourage you to do that. OK, well, send me what you have. I will look at it, bring it to the mayor. I mean, it sounds like we're on the same page, right? Everybody wants well, the same thing. Wait, but I, this is Commissioner Mintz, but is, is going through this process going to inhibit us from getting it out as, as soon as we can and that's what i'm concerned about because time is of the essence you know we're Absolutely. editing we're editing this live and if if the chief and the mayor agree that's excellent and they can do their own statement um in in a time frame that is suitable for them but i i think that if we have the commissioners here and we've agreed on um, you know, this this new language to not incorporate George Floyd, then I think that we should edit it, vote on it, and then get it out to the public under the guise of education. Great, but can you and, just like give me a minute to try and do no, I, I don't I don't see I don't, way or no? I don't I don't see why that's that's necessary taking okay. into account the amount right, of fair. time that has taken for us to get to this uh, point. Ms. Ritchie, this is uh, Commissioner Devinish. I have a question. If the mayor and uh, whatever bodies agree with it, they can just share it on their page or, you know, approve, say, you know, the Civil Rights Commission came up with this language. I, we approve and we endorse it. So it can be used more than once. It doesn't have to be just used once. So I agree with Mr. Uh, Rance that we've been talking about this for what, uh, what seems like five weeks, but maybe not, maybe I'm being excessive, but it's, it, it's been a while and, uh, you know, they're, they're in deliberation. So we do need to, and aside from George Floyd, we just need to come up with ways of, if you feel your rights have been violated, this is what you do. And at that, at this point, that's what this is. So, I, you know, I support Commissioner Rance, and I, I don't think that's what this is. I'm sorry, but I mean, I think I think people know. I mean, we have the Civil Rights Department, and there are lots of ways to file complaints. And I honestly, I feel like this is. We're, you know, we're going to, as the MCCR, put out what we want to do. And, you know, regardless of whether the mayor or the council take our advice, we're going to do it. And that's okay. I'm totally fine with that. The thing that I'm asking for is, like, like give me a chance to, like, I, I, I haven't even read it. I don't even know what you're putting out. So, like, could I have maybe 12? 13, 14 hours to just look at it and brief the mayor and like see if we can do something together or are you just dead set on going forward regardless? This is, this is Commissioner Gold. I'm sorry, I have my hand up for a while. Um, I'm a part of the task force 
and I'm feeling very fiery tonight. And I object to asking the mayor and the chief Arredondo. Um, we need to move with a, a quickness. We've already sanitized this, as my fellow Commissioner Rant has said, which to me is whitewashing. Um, and we need to get it out. We we need to educate. And as somebody, there's no also as somebody who's pretty involved in the community, there's absolutely no trust in the Minneapolis Police Department right now. So I don't want them endorsing this if they are to take us serious as a body right now. Um, I'm happy to like do that in the future or whatever, but I feel really strongly about it. Like we need to edit this document, vote on it, and, and let's go. Let's move. Mm -hmm. and, and can I, I would just add okay, jump in and say I respect that. Can I propose something? I think that um there is a great opportunity for us to work. Well, excuse me. For us to work with Director Ritchie and the mayor's office, and um, maybe we can vote to to pass this statement that we're making as a commission, and to also uh, Director Ritchie, maybe there's time tomorrow or within the next 48 hours where we can, you know, some people from that um, subcommittee can meet with you and whoever else in the mayor's office to discuss like what your ideas and thoughts are. Cause I do think overall, like this is, we do want to support. We want to come off as a strong front. And I think that also we are an independent body and we just want like, we don't want to feel like we're going to be silenced by uh, like the authority in a sense. Maybe that's just my perspective, but I would say another thing um, just from my observation was that I don't think that we got a good introduction of you, Director Ritchie, or like that you were here or why. And I think understanding that, like why you're coming here, that you want to work with us and not that you want to like police what we're saying, that would be really helpful to <clears throat> kind of have like an easier like okay th this is why we mm -hmm. want to come together not that you want to monitor what we want to put out because it may make the mayor look a certain way you know like just to be very transparent like these are thoughts no, that I'm having all right you guys don't know me uh so I guess um, I was born in Minneapolis I've worked for the city for 15 years I started with Gary Schiff in the ninth ward i worked with him for eight years um and then <laughs> actually kind of fell into the job with jacob because he married my husband and i um while i was working for gary Schiff. i've worked on a lot of different issues but before i worked for government i went to augsburg for political science international relations i spent many years on the streets in Minneapolis as a 14, 15, 16, and 17 year old runaway. And so I guess, there you go, that's my perspective. I don't know how to give it more upfront and direct in a nutshell, but um, I deeply care about my community. I've got a couple kids who um, had, you know, five years ago, got into an altercation with eight cops guns drawn on them at a traffic stop in Brooklyn Center. And um, I'm just, I'm trying to figure out shit the same way you are. So I guess I don't know how to make it more real than that. <clears throat> this is Commissioner Stignani. I think there is benefit for being a neutral ground between the city council and the mayor. I think we have an opportunity to be independent as well as healing with respect to that. Um, I do think we should approve ready. We should approve a statement and give the power to the executive committee to then integrate with uh, the mayor's office and the city council for that matter, uh, because I would rather we act or you know, act and become Switzerland rather than, you know, represent as the the. Uh, you know, the the executor of any one uh, 
policy. I think we need to attain our independence. We need to be seen as independent, and we think we need to um, invite people to join us, but maintain our independence at the same time. So, uh, again, I apologize for dominating here. I'll leave as many people with their hands up, so I will release the floor. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bergquist. I'll just add on to that. I want to support the task force and its work, and I want to emphasize that, that independence is particularly important in an election year, um, and that we haven't heard from the mayor's office in a long time. And now it's an election year, and we're hearing from the mayor's office. That's all. Um, Commissioner Lauren. Um, I. I appreciate the mayor's office's, you know, desire to work with us, and I think that's awesome, and I look forward to doing that in the future. I, I would, however, like to um, just make a practical point, which is that the mayor is a, along with uh, the police chief, Minneapolis police, and the city council are also targets of this statement, if you will. You know, we're addressing them in this statement, and it literally doesn't make much sense to have a statement that that addresses them to be from them. So the statement will require pretty substantial rewriting um, in order to have it be a, a joint statement and quite a bit of work. So just from kind of a practical standpoint, it um, and I, I realize, Ms. Ritchie, you haven't had a chance to read it. In its entirety, but it just doesn't really make sense. Um, so I would, I would um, recommend that we move forward with some minor alterations, um, and that we look for opportunities to work together in the future. Thank you, Commissioner Lord. Miss Neef, you raise your hand up as well. I did briefly raise my hand, but my my comment may not um, any longer be necessary. I had heard a reference to the executive committee, and I just wanted to remind commissioners that the executive committee, if you have it meet, does need to give have a properly noticed public meeting. Um, so you do need to account for time for that. Um, we have another hand up. Mr. Swift. Oh, Swift. Yes, yeah, sorry, it says guest. Commissioner Swift. Oh, I'm sorry. That was purely accidental, although um, I would uh, concur with what Commissioner Gold said in terms of the practicality matter of um, who this letter is addressed to and its need for this speed. So should we remove to or move to re edit this on the fly and, and get busy? Yes. I second that. Can we have the clerk call the roll on the motion? Was there a request? Uh, sorry, just a point of clarification. Are are we moving to adopt the statement as edited? Is that the motion that we're voting on now? The motion would be to live at this. Oh, yes, I support that motion. Okay. Commissioner Cobia. Commissioner Cobia. Repeat that one more time. I, Amy cut out. I couldn't hear what the vote is on. Commissioner Cobia, this is Commissioner Stignani. The motion is to. Uh, live edit this statement to remove uh, references to the trial, uh, you know, sanitize it in the manner that can be ready for, you know, release. I vote yes. Thank you. Commissioner Davis. Yes. Commissioner Devinish. Yes. Commissioner Farrar. Yes. Commissioner Fee. Yes. Commissioner Fine. Yes. Commissioner Folk. Yes. Commissioner Gold. Yep. Commissioner Hartz.
Trips in her hearts. Sorry, yes. Commissioner Herkman. Yes. Commissioner Lord. Yes. Commissioner Rounds. Yes. Commissioner Shepard. Yes. Commissioner Singani. Yes. Commissioner Swift. Yes. Commissioner Witseth. Yes. Commissioner Crowder. Abstain. Commissioner Stevens. Commissioner Stevens. I believe she did have to leave. Okay, thank you. Vice Chair Shoemake. Yes. Chair Colas. Yes. There are 19 ayes and one abstention. That motion passes. Uh, we will begin to edit that statement for, for release. Sin Commissioner Signani. Uh, Chair Lord has uh, from the task force has put an edit on into the chat. I would like people to read it and um, potentially have commentary towards it. And for anyone who's not on the chat, um, please let us read it to you if you'd like. Uh, yes, I would recommend either Commissioner Lord or Stignani could read the amendment to the opening paragraph. I defer to Chair Lord. Uh, sure, I can read it. So, thank you for whoever crossed this out. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. Um, so we would just have a simple statement, which would start with the Minneapolis Commission on Civil Rights, MCCR, supports and defends the rights of our community members to exercise their civil rights. And then we would go to the transition sentence to this end, the MCCR supports these peaceful actions. And then our enumerated actions would follow. I move to accept these. I second. Can we have the clerk call the uh, call the roll to, on the motion? Is there any other discussion? I'll go ahead. Sorry, Sorry go ahead. You can call the roll. I believe that was our discussion, unless anyone has anything else to add. Commissioner Burkhorst. Yes. Commissioner Kobia. Yes. Commissioner Davis. Yes. Commissioner Devinish. Yes. Commissioner Ferrar. Yes. Commissioner Fee. Yes. Commissioner Fine. Yes. Commissioner Folk. Yes. Commissioner Gold. Yes. Commissioner Hartz. I abstain. Commissioner Herkman. Yes. Commissioner Lord. Yes. Commissioner Rounds. Yes. Commissioner Shepard. Yes. Commissioner Stignani. Yes. Commissioner Swift. Yes. Commissioner Woodseth. Yes. Commissioner Crowder. Abstain. Commissioner Stevens. Vice Chair Shoemake. Yes. Chair Colas. Yes. There are 18 ayes and two abstentions. That motion passes. Thank you. Um, I did see you. Yeah. Yep, we have a hand up, Andrea. Yes, Chair May, I was just going to inquire. I think there was some discussion of renaming the task force, and I would recommend that that um, go forward as well if you uh, want to um, continue forward with this, um, uh, making it clear that it's not uh, in any way a reference to the trial anymore. Um, I think Commissioner Stignani had a uh, suggestion Oops. for a name, but I wasn't clear on whether a motion had been made on that. 
Thank you. Commissioner Stignani moves to change the name of the task force to the expression of civil rights opportunities and actions for the public. This is Commissioner Herkman. I wonder, um, and I'm very happy to not only stay on this, um, this group, but um, I wonder if we might just now move the responsibilities now that we have a community engagement um, subcommittee already and the point of this group was a timely um, getting this particular piece out in a timely manner if we might move that responsibility over to the community engagement um, to more just streamline activities i think that's a great idea to dissolve this task force and move move those over to the uh, ENR. I think that's a great idea, Paul. That makes sense. I think David also mentioned that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so should we move to dissolve the task force and move this statement to the uh, ENR committee? Or, or are we are we delaying ourselves by doing that? Is my question. I, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, I, I would move that um, we ask the department, and I know Kayla helped us with this before, to make these changes on the version of the letter that is on Minneapolis Civil Rights, the Minneapolis Commission of Civil Rights letterhead, and to distribute that letter back to all of us on letterhead in the next 24 to 48 hours so we can pursue our socializations. Um, is that a movement we could make? If that's a question to the to the department, this is Kayla, that, that would be something yeah. that we could do. Yes, we could put that on letterhead in the next 24 to 48 hours, sure. And distribute it back to all the commissioners. I Kayla, I had actually written uh, an email with some um, thought starters on how it could be socialized. So so I can follow up with you on that and resend that to you, but it had some um, specifics about ideas about how to socialize that. Sure, yep, absolutely. Okay, do we need a movement for that or is that, can that, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know. Do we, do we already have a motion on the floor right now with, um, the changing. Oh wait, no, we're going to be. Oh, solving. yeah. Uh, I'll restate it. Um, Commissioner Sinani moves to dissolve the task force, to transfer ownership of this statement to the regular subcommittee, and to, you know, continue pushing this out. Uh, post haste. I second the motion. And is there any other discussion on this before the clerk calls the roll? To, is is there agreeance on? Oh wait, we're. I keep forgetting we've already decided to not change the name of the task force. Yeah. If there's any, if there's no discussion, we can have the clerk call the roll. Commissioner Burquist. Yes. Commissioner Cobia. Yes. Commissioner Davis. Yes. Commissioner Devonish. Yes. Commissioner Farrar. Yes. Commissioner Fee. Yes. Commissioner Fine. Yes. Commissioner Folk. Yes. Commissioner Gold. Yes. Commissioner Hartz. Abstain. Abstain. Commissioner Herkman. Yes. Commissioner Lord. Yes. Commissioner Rounds. Yes. Commissioner Shepard. Yes. Commissioner Stanani. Yes. Commissioner Swift. Yes. Commissioner Witseth. Yeah. Commissioner Crowder. Abstain. Commissioner Stevens. Commissioner Shoemake. 
Yes. Chair Colas. Yes. There are 18 ayes and two abstentions. That motion passes. We'll be moving the task force to the larger community and research team um, subcommittee. And live editing. So are, is the clerk's office able to help us with that? Uh, Commissioner Stignani has one, one quite question. Please. Can we add the other, add the other. references to the, uh, the other references from the earlier commission letter, joint civil rights department letter uh, to this letter as well? Because I thought I felt some of them were very good, including um, communications to you know Mayor Fry's office and other things, which you know would go in the spirit of what we're doing here. They're simple links. I know there's no, there's nothing other than links. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Stignani, this is Commissioner Gold. Will you just repeat that? For some reason, my internet was lagging or you broke up and I couldn't hear. Certainly, and uh, there was an earlier uh, joint um, statement by the heads of the Civil Rights Department and the MCCR in May of 2020 that had a sufficient number of resource links, but I, th I felt were very helpful. Uh, Ted, could you pr put those links back up for us just so that for those who don't have the, the archival copy of that, you can see kind of the links and see if there's anything that causes reject or objection to anyone. I think there's just, the more is more in this respect. Thank you. Yep. If this is a motion, I'll second it. This is Commissioner Burquist. It is a motion. Move to 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 amend uh, the statement with the previous uh, released uh, references from the Civil Rights Department and the MCCR. So uh, this is this is our current one. The other one is the other one uh, with the with the odd title on it. Ted, there you go. That's it. Mm. Great, thank you, Commissioner Stagnani. Is there any discussion before the clerk calls the roll on um, whether or not we add this to the statement, these resources? I, I would, this is Commissioner Lord. I would like to point out there's some risk in phone numbers and email addresses that have that are over a year old. People change their phone numbers. Mm -hmm. um, People's emails get disconnected. I think yeah. unless we have validated that all of those are active phone numbers or active email addresses, it's very frustrating to provide resources that go to nowhere or yeah. that are incorrect. Thank you, Commissioner Lord. I, I would agree with that. And I do think that before we do give out some of these phone numbers, I see personal names and phone numbers that we are asking if it's OK to be releasing or offering them. Um, as resources, I just know that's that has come up before. Let me amend my motion then. Uh, amend, you know, I mean, the amendment is as you know, provided these still are valid. It would take you know a short period of time. We'd be happy to volunteer to you know validate these. Um, as part of the as part of my effort here. Yeah. Absolutely. And we can remove personal names. Well, I just meant I've I've been a part of where we made a list of resources and then people are like, how did my name get on this list? And so I'd want to make sure that it's OK that we're but I think these are important resources. For our community when we're looking at healing and the trauma and demonstrating and, and the purpose of, of what why we're doing what we're doing. I think these are great resources for our community. So I. I you know. To the degree I can amend, amend the emotions, the motion to remove personal names that are um, where, where they're listed and replace those with links and telephone numbers that are given out as business numbers rather than personal numbers. How, what do do people have opinion on 
this these resources and and feel strongly that these be incorporated into the the new letter, the new statement. If um, Commissioner Signani is able to verify the information. This is Commissioner Burquist. I'll second the motion. Can we have the clerk call the roll on the motion? Commissioner Burquist. Yes. Commissioner Cobia. Yes. Commissioner Davis. Yes. Commissioner Devinish. Yes. Commissioner Farrar. Yes. Commissioner Fee. Yes. Commissioner Fine. Yes. Commissioner Folk. Commissioner Folk. Yes. Commissioner Gold. Yes. Commissioner Hertz. Abstain. Commissioner Herkman. Yes. Commissioner Lord. Yes. Commissioner Rance. Yes. Commissioner Shepard. Yes. Commissioner Stanani. Yes. Commissioner Swift. Yes. Commissioner Whitseth. Yeah. Commissioner Crowder. Abstain. Commissioner Stevens. Vice Chair Shoemake. Yes. Chair Colas. Yeah. There are 18 ayes and two abstentions. That motion passes. Thank you, everyone. So, um, with that, was there anything else that that test? You know, we'll move on to the. I think it would be a smooth transition to go to the community engagement and research committee for an update. Oh, chair. I'm sorry. Chair Colossus. I'm a chair. Um, I was raising my hand because we've been going for two and a half hours and I do have another commitment outside of here. And while it's open ended, I'm afraid I'm not able to continue for any longer beyond day 30. So if I may, I'd like to be excused and leave. Well, thank you, um, Commissioner Farrar, for participating tonight. Thank you all very much. Yeah, can we get a, if, if that was everything from the task force, um, can we get an update from the Community Engagement and Research Committee? Um, would love to hear um, who are the new chairs of the committees and um, yeah, how the just an update from your first month as a committee. This is this is Commissioner Gold and uh, Commissioner Stevens nominated me for chair of the committee, so I am the chair, along with the co-chair, vice chair, um, Commissioner Folk. And so at our first meeting, we discussed um, the essay, the MLK essay contest, starting that back up. And we talked about ma not making it just kind of like a, a one-time essay contest, but kind of expanding it to be multimedia. So more, um, more artistic, you know, spoken word, um, photography, painting, um, things like that, short stories, um, and having it be around other civil rights leaders or activists, um, you know, Angela Davis, Fred Hampton, um, but keeping the MLK essay like on Martin Luther King Day. Um, and we did talk about um, kind of like how to, there's there's a prize, there's like a cash prize. So we were wondering um, how we would go about kind of seeing what our budget would be for something like I've, that. I've got that all that information. Uh, this okay. is Commissioner Crowder, and I can tell you guys about it at the exact meeting or whatever. But I got that from Kayla this cool. morning. Cool, thank you. Um, I'll make this quick because I know we want to. Okay, we also talked about supporting 
um, vice chairs to make in their Crown Act resolution. We all voted on it and we, we back it 100%. So however they need support, we're there to support them. Um, we talked about kind of socializing and promoting the commission as a whole. So getting a picture with just like a little bio or a few sentences about each commissioner because um, Commissioner Folk and myself uh, have access to the social media uh, Facebook page. Um, I'm not sure about Twitter or if there's an Instagram, I'm happy to make either or, but um, doing some sort of promotion that way. Um, and um, we talked about other issues that we wanna tackle this coming year with the achievement gap um, in Minneapolis, um, housing, engaging communities of color around the vaccine. Um, and Commissioner Devinish, um, a, she, she and I are gonna shoot a little video of her talking about her experience getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and we're gonna socialize that on social media to kind of educate um, folks in Minneapolis and also um, really try to reach communities of color um, and educate um, and maybe alleviate some sort of anxieties that folks may have. Um, we talked about uh, focusing on ending qualified immunity and then also like promoting and doing community outreach around voting since this is an election year. And if I missed anything, anybody can jump in from the subcommittee. Um, this is Commissioner Devish. Thank you, Commissioner Gold. Um, I, you know, I the only thing I want to touch on is um, uh, Commissioner is participating in providing a picture and a short bio. This is something that I brought up last year. Um, so I'm hoping to have. Uh, some support this year. And I think it's important for our community members when they see us in public and to be transparent and um, maybe why we joined the commission. Um, but it can just be two to three sentences. It doesn't have to be anything long. I, I look at other uh, community websites that have um, commissions uh, like ours. And I, I just think it's more approachable and um, provides uh, conversation with uh, the people that we serve. I think that's great. I would be excited if all of, all of our commissioners would be willing to to email that information to who would that go to? Would that go to you, Cindy or Commissioner Devinish? Um, no, it's fine. Um, I'm not sure on how to do that, but it's something mm -hmm. I'd be more than happy to throw my hat at and, and, and try to put something together. Yeah. Oh, this is Commissioner Gold. I was going to suggest maybe moving to a motion that if all commissioners could send Commissioner Devinish, Commissioner Folk, and I, maybe I could just send out an email with all of us on it. And then you guys, um, all the commissioner, the body can send us that by, you know, the next meeting, May 17th. So it gives you a month to look your best and find something fun and witty to say about yourself. Or if you want less time, you know. But I would move to that motion to vote on it to give people an incentive. Yeah, I'll second that. Um, can we do it? Is there, if there's no discussion, while we'll the clerk call the roll to for that motion. Chair May, there's a question um, by Commissioner Signani is, do you want the photo to be professional or casual? I think it'd be fun to have either or, you know, I think it could show your personality, you know. <laughs> so I don't know what other people think, but that's just my thought. I'm not sure the world's ready for my personality. <laughs> so, I think I think we are. I think we can take it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Claire, can you call the roll on the motion? Commissioner Burquist. Yes. Commissioner Cobia. Commissioner Cobia.
Mr. Davis. Uh, this is Kobe. Sorry, yes. my headset died. I say yes too. Okay, thank you. Is that a yes, Commissioner Davis? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Devinish? Yes. Commissioner Farrar? Commissioner Fee? Yes. Commissioner Fine? Yes. Commissioner Folk? Yes. Commissioner Gold? Yes. Commissioner Hartz? Commissioner Hartz? Yes. Commissioner Herkman? Yes. Commissioner Lord? Yes. Commissioner Rance? Yes. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Commissioner Sinani? Yes. Commissioner Swift? Yes. Commissioner Woodseff? Yes. Commissioner Crowder? Yes. Commissioner Stevens. Vice Chair Shoemake. Yes. Chair Colas. Yeah. Yes. There are 19 ayes. That motion passes. Um, I see Andrea, uh, Ms. Neve has a comment. Um, just due to open meeting law, we need to avoid group emails. Um, so just thinking of ways to to get that information to the community engagement and research committee before the next meeting. Would it, would it be okay to send it to just the chair, which is um, um, Commissioner Gold? Would that be acceptable? Yeah, it looks like one way emails from Commissioner, from individuals to Commissioner Gold are fine. So, sorry, that's correct. Sorry, I jumped on too quickly. But okay. yes, you can send individual, you can as an individual send an email to Commissioner Gold. Just please do not um, make, start sending group emails. That is where the problem comes up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that update. I, like, I'm just shocked by all the things that have been worked on in the last month. So I'm really excited for the things that we'll be able to, to work on together. I'm wondering, um, I know that with the task force, we were all getting emails for the meetings. Um, well, are, are only the commissioners that are in the committees moving forward be getting the emails for the meetings? That's I can, I yes, I can um, clarify that. It seemed at first it did create some confusion when I did invite everyone that everyone, some people felt like they were expected to attend. So I can, if you would like include everyone or include specifically you to all the subcommittees and task force meetings. Okay, great. Well, we can talk about that and that's awesome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, how about the standards and procedures committee? Okay. How much time do we have? I'm kidding. We met about a week and a half ago and considered a number of items. Uh, but first, I was I was elected chair, and Commissioner Signani was elected the vice chair. And we decided to meet quarterly, so our next meeting won't be for three months. Except that the reason we did that is we thought we could still meet any time uh, when there's business that the commission wishes us uh, to discuss. Uh, so we really sort of discussed uh, two issues. One was uh, open meeting communication, and it was decided that we would request the city attorney, uh, uh, Nath, to uh, give us a clarification about open meeting uh, communication because of emails, which was just brought up, of course. And... Uh, I just got, I think, sort of a final draft today, and I think our technology group has it, but I wonder so that we don't have so much time in the meeting, if maybe it it could be circulated by staff to all the commissioners. Oh, there, and then, then in addition, that could be circulated to commissioners is, uh, well, the next subject was excused and unexcused absences. 
And so we had decided that rule 602, we wanted to discuss excuse and unexcused absences to improve the procedure after, you know, based on what's been happening in the past. And so we had decided that rule 602 would be amended to require the secretary to send out a notice of absence of part or all of the meeting within one week after a meeting. And if, if, uh, if the just a sec, I want to get this right. Uh, so, so the secretary would send out a notice of absence of part or all of the meeting with within one week after the meeting. If the notice isn't sent out, if it's failed to have been sent out, the absence is con actually considered excused. If a notice is sent, the commissioner may request the absence be excused. And so we thought that might sort of take care of things so that at least we aren't dealing with excused absences uh, for a long period of time from now. Uh, if an, the, 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 other, the other issue was examples of excused absences, and I think in front of you, which tech uh, tech staff has has put forward, was set forth by Commissioner Cobia about examples of uh, of excused absences, just to give people an idea, uh, so that you know we took a look at this. So we've got that, and we've also got the um, the clarification from the city attorney and open meeting communications. I don't know if there's any questions. Could we scroll down a little more on that so we can read the whole statement? OK. Attorney Knapp has asked the question. Yes, it looks like she's wondering is SNP proposing an amendment to the IOP and is there a draft for the commission to consider? I guess we are proposing an amendment. Commissioner Fine, this is Commissioner Cobia. But I, it could be just as I recited. Um, this is Commissioner Cobia. I don't know if you can hear me. My internet's in and out, but I, I didn't write these intending to be um, anything more than suggestions. Uh, and I figured we would maybe have some follow up with the commission as a whole, but you know whatever commissioner fine wants to propose that's acceptable you know that's fine too yeah this was the, what what commissioner which is these examples aren't meant to be passed by the commission it was just a, a, a group of based on you know sort of a guy what we could recommend is to change 602 to amend it requiring the secretary to send out a notice of absent part or all of the meeting within one week. And that if if, if the notice has not been or 
if the notice has not been sent out within the week, the note, the absence is considered excused. If the notice is sent, the commissioner may request the absence be excused. This is Commissioner Fee. Can I suggest actually that we table this discussion um, until the next meeting? I don't know about anybody else, but my my brain is getting a little fried and these distinctions are kind of passing me by. <clears throat> this is Commissioner Stiani. Okay with me. Go ahead. Uh, Commissioner Stignani here is, uh, I think we have uh, a couple of things that the SMP committee has to get back to, um, including, you know, some new matters. Uh, so I'd like to, if, if, if Chair Fine is fine with this, uh, I'd like to motion to table this. I'll just withdraw the motion. Thank you, Commissioner Fine. Were there any other updates from this committee? No, I think that was it. Thank you for that. Um, we'll be tabling this for the next meeting. Sounds great. OK, and then we have the Workforce and Contract Compliance Committee. Hi, this is Commissioner Cobia. Um, I was elected chair and Commissioner Rance was elected vice chair. Uh, we have set an ambitious schedule for ourselves. I guess I can turn on my video so you don't have to look at Commissioner Fine's lovely wallpaper, which is lovely. Um, and uh, OK, so just real quick to talk about what we have. Um, we're going to try to continue to work on what we did last year, which is improving non-legal aspects of the complaint process. We're going to work on um, determining whether any businesses are repeat litigants, work with the department to try to create a better information flow um, and get the director of the contract compliance department more involved with the commission, discuss helping um, the department creator maintain a list of businesses that are owned by women or uh, minorities with work on proactively approaching these businesses to apply for contracts as well as seeing what uh, worked well or following up to identify barriers for their applications. We also are going to work on making sure that the city's definition of women or minority owned business is coherent, especially in consideration of state definitions and federal definitions, which all may be different. Um, and then uh, furthering the, the subcommittee's stated goal, we will provide educational support in how to obtain a city contract, following up with um, various local community groups that are focused on small business and local business. Um, and encourage the city, the last one is encourage the city to focus on Long term changes with city, particularly encouraging the city to continue the, the outreach programs that they've had ongoing, um, including local business groups that are contracted with the city um, or, or groups that are out on the street, um, such as the there were a few groups that were related to small business that were um, allowed out after curfew. Um, in the in the last curfew time. And uh, also I, I watched Mayor Fry today state that he was ramping up more contracts or, or more groups like that. And um, so we will work to encourage, you know, that to on to to keep on going. I think we have a, a very passionate group here and uh, that's all I, I have. Uh, you know, Commissioner Rance is vice chair. Did you have anything to add? Um, no, that was very thorough. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cobia. Um, next, we have the vice an update from the vice chair. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, my update is really around the review panels. So, um, March, we had three review panels and we got them all done by April 15th. Um, we have two of the three April review panels co completed. So I don't know which which panel, sorry, my dog. 
which panel it is that uh, is still yet to get in their um, their review, but that will be due by the end of the month. Um, I sent out an email on March 17th with uh, kind of an outline calendar of, um, you know, just the forecast of all of the panels that we'll have through August. So I haven't gotten any um, emails back saying that the calendar doesn't work for anyone. So please um, reach out to people who are on your same panel for any given month, even if it's like a month or two or three out schedule time. And if you have the energy, you can let me and Matthew know and we can grant you access to the case files early if you want to, like if you're able to set time and have your review panel within a given time. We're not going to grant access to documents and then let them sit out there for you for months on end. But if you are ready to review your documents, you let us know and we can get moving on those. Um, Matthew has been working on getting out the conflicts of interest for all of the panelists. So I think he got out everything for May, I would assume. And then um, he's going to work on like within the next couple weeks, getting out all of the conflicts of interest forms for all of the panels that we have scheduled through August. So that will help reduce any shuffling that will need to happen right before a panel. Lastly, um, there are two contested cases. And so I've been working with Kayla in the department on preparing for all of that. I will have a contact who's an investigator in the department who I will be working with on kind of managing and doing all the administrative work for the contested case hearings. However, it would be really helpful if I had an attorney on the commission that could partner with me so that I would have the legal mind um, to kind of you know, manage what needs to get done and just think ahead on everything. So um, I have the list of the attorneys on the commission, but it, does anyone have an interest in supporting me with this? I think there is some pre-work that will have to be done. We'll probably get into it this summer. And then come the fall, I think it will be a lot, maybe more time intensive. So Kayla can speak to that. But for now, if there are any attorney commissioners that would be willing to work with me on contested case hearings, please let me know now. Commissioner Woodseth here. Two comments, if I yeah. may. I would love to assist. Please, please tap me in if anyone else wants to jump Thank in. You. Cool, but I'd love to help. And second, I want to just for the record here uh, commend Vice Chair Shoemaker on really accelerating the panels and give her just kudos here that she's due for um, the long overdue work of getting these panels done. I think it's been impressive project management. And I really appreciate your dedication to this. It's my for pleasure. Sure. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you. Nice job, Janelle. Thank you. So, okay, Commissioner Woodseth, I will, um, we'll set up some time just to connect and I will include you on any meetings or emails that I have with the department contacts on all of this, and then we'll just get the ball rolling. So I'm, a, I think I'm a little bit ahead of it. Um, I worry I'm annoying Kayla <laughs> in sending out emails, being like, "Who's my contact?" Um, but they're you they're aren't annoying aware. me, Janelle. <laughs> they're aware, so yeah, we're getting it handled. But um, Commissioner Woodset, that would be awesome. We can really get organized and just figure out everything that needs to get done and then hopefully set like an easier playbook for future contested case hearings as well. Awesome. Ready to get rolling. Awesome. So I think that is, um, let me just look the end of my notes. Um, just so a few other notes. So big thank you to Matthew for getting out the all of the, just the access to the documents and organizing everything in SharePoint. It's a lot more work on the back end than we under, like, really realize. So thank you so much for that. Um, 
I've been on two panels now. And as a non-attorney, sometimes I would say it's kind of like hectic getting a ton of documents and not really knowing how to go through them. So if anyone who hasn't been on a panel before has a question, feel free to reach out to me and we can just jump on the phone and talk about it. But overall, um, the the recommended order to go through would be to start with the determination of the department and then from there start chronologically with the documents or go through the the different folders but definitely starting with the determination can help uh build kind of a roadmap for what you're going to be looking at and then yeah i think that's it uh reminder for the april panel to get your your de decision and by the end of the month and then may panels please have i sent all of y'all emails so just get your time set up and uh you should be getting access to documents soon um yeah if there are any questions anything i can help with let me know thank you commissioner shoemake and thank you commissioner woodseth for for volunteering to assist with those um contested case hearings you bet um, you bet quick update from myself um wanted to let everyone know that we've been working on reaching out to the mayor's office i know we had a guest today um but we were working on reaching out to the mayor's office just regarding um the work that we've been doing with the statement regarding educating the residents of minneapolis on their rights um so we've been trying to get on their agenda and Commissioner Signani has been great in um, connecting with uh, staff such as Becky Bolin from uh, the mayor's office to potentially get on their agenda. So that is in the works. Um, and then uh, along with that, we have were able to have some conversations with some city council members. And um, out of that came a resolution for non-lethal, um, the use of less lethal weapons in Minneapolis. And we did have the opportunity to um, sign or to. I don't know how you would put sign off on uh, their their resolution by uh, council members Gordon Ellison and Schroeder. Um, and so that resolution was passed on Friday um, and that Commissioner Stignani, I didn't know if you wanted to talk more about that, but out of out of some of those conversations regarding this less lethal a resolution, which I will have Ian send out to the commission as a whole. Um, but in regards to this resolution, out of this came some opportunity to potentially partner with the um, city council and then potentially even other uh, like the PCOC, um, the police oversight committee uh, regarding the use of their less least lethal weapons and doing some research around that. And so, like I was saying, Commissioner Signani, if you wanted to speak more to that, that would be great. But basically, it would be great to to have a, a committee that would be willing to to work on this with the, the council. So I, I'll just add a little color to this, if you don't mind, uh, Chair May. Uh, so the city council passed a uh, resolution on use of non-lethal weapons like flashbangs and kinetic rounds and tear gas and whatnot on Friday. Embedded in that resolution was a request to the, the MCCR to engage in research and discovery around uh, usage of those devices by the Minneapolis police. Um, you know, wasn't much more than that, but I do believe we should be at least setting up a um, an exploratory group to work with the mayor and the city council to see what that might look like and then come back and report it at our next meeting to, um, you know, formalize and, and adopt agreement to it. Um, unless anyone wants to vote on it tonight, and I think everybody's brains are a little more fried than normal, but I'm happy to engage in whatever discussion around that uh, the, the committee would like or the commission would like. Yeah. And just for some context, you know, one of the points that we were going to be talking about tonight, which happened naturally, which was great, was regarding um, the renaming or pivoting of the task force for the accountability of the killing of George Floyd. 
Um, and so I feel like that did kind of happen naturally, but that was a conversation regarding, you know, we previously had a policing task force and this is something that they should take on, but um, it sounds like that kind of happened naturally. So just wanting to, to see where potentially this would fit in and if the chairs of the committees would want to even discuss it with the with their members or if there's um, a committee that would want to take this task on. And if that was you, Commissioner Sinyani with SNP, um, please let me know if I'm overstepping. Uh, I I think we need to figure out what what is with the city attorney and everybody else, what's, yeah. what's actually possible mm -hmm. first. Because uh, there has been, as we've discussed, some issues with data access. And so if we have to go back and ask the city council for data access or the mayor's office for data access, um, you know, again, as the attorney Trammell said, we are a limited organization, even though we're an independent advisory board. Um, I would encourage us to, you know, work with our city council mm -hmm. as well as our mayor's office to have access to the data so that this is not a sham uh, exercise in the first place. In the second place, there is a University of Minnesota study. I would like to invite the chair of that study or the head of the of the public health group at the University of Minnesota to speak at our next council meeting as well to discuss the non-lethal weapons uh, study that they had done as well. So um, sorry to sound like I'm pushing the peanut down the road here, but um, I, I think we can bring in a lot of a lot of different things to bear in the next meeting. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's even something that I'd be excited to to take on as well. Um, so thank you, Commissioner Sinyani. Um, our next update is from the Civil Rights Department staff, um, the director of the Complaint Investigation and Contract Compliance. Hi everyone. Um, so the, uh, you all know me, but um, Kayla McConnandera, I'm the interim manager for complaint investigations. Um, I don't believe the director of contract compliance is here tonight, um, but we could invite him to attend um, a future meeting. I will be very brief because I know it's getting late, um, but I just wanted to, you know, update you that the the department is still clicking along with cases and things like that. We've um, really appreciated the work that the commission has done, especially in the last two months on review panel cases. That really helps us um, you know feel like cases are, are getting a, an ultimate conclusion and we can communicate that to complainants and that's really been helpful um, so we look forward to continuing to work together on that and working together on those contested case hearings um, I really appreciate Commissioner Shoemake's um, attention to getting those things moving and that's really really helpful and appreciated and and something that I know is gonna be really great moving forward um, I also just wanted to express gratitude to the members Members of the Commission that have met with us throughout the month. I know that there's been a lot going on um, and a lot of kind of, you know, sensitive topics at play um, that I know are affecting people in their personal lives in addition to potentially their work on the Commission and our work in the Civil Rights Department. So I just want to acknowledge um, that we really appreciate the department really appreciates your willingness to engage um, and work with us around those sensitive issues um, and we look forward to continuing to work together moving forward um, i'm my door is virtually always open um, so feel free to send me an email give me a call if questions come up or there are things that you know you could use uh, department assistance on thanks thank you and then we have Oh, I see. That's one line. It's just two lines on mine. So I think thank you for all the commissioners and the uh, department staff for those updates. Um, with that, we've concluded all items on our agenda for this meeting um, and I'll see everyone back here on May 17th, I believe, for our regular meeting. Wondering if the chairs and vice chairs could stick around for the executive meeting afterwards. Um, and then Seeing no further business to come before us and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair Collis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.